Welcome to this tutorial on how to create the ultimate Excel Gantt chart for project management. A Gantt chart is arguably the most widely used project planning tool and Excel allows you to quickly set up a simple Gantt chart, but you can also build a really outstanding version with many advanced and interactive features, making this a professional project planning and management tool. Let's take a quick look at the final Excel template that we're gonna build today. It allows you to set up an advanced and workday focused project schedule consisting of project stages with task and milestone items. Setting up a schedule for these items is as easy as defining the number of required workdays and then either entering an independent start or end date manually or making use of the core feature of this template, a fully implemented dependency engine. With this dependency engine, you can make one item dependent on another one by creating a connection through an intuitive ID system. The columns next to the referenced ID instantly display all the fundamental information about the referenced item. And what makes this feature so incredibly powerful, there are four possible dependency connection types to choose from, which are either a forward scheduling finish to start or start to start dependency, or a backward scheduling start to finish or finish to finish dependency. Notice how both the stage bar and the project time span instantly adapt to the changes made. The way this dependency engine is built enables you to set up consecutive dependencies with different dependency connection types in a matter of seconds. Any new task or milestone item you add below a stage is instantly assigned to that stage via an automated stage ID system. The same way, you can quickly create a new stage with its own items. Notice how the whole area and the item names are automatically formatted and structured based on the selection you make. What is really amazing, with this dependency engine, you are not limited to creating dependencies within a stage, you can also make stages dependent on other stages. For a forward-oriented stage dependency, for example, you only have to make the initial item in your stage dependent on another stage. Then, a set of standardized formulas allows you to make the stage update based on its items. And finally, you can make the other items consecutively dependent on that initial item, define the number of workdays, and make sure that the milestone ends together with the preceding task. After that, it will only take seconds to add another consecutive stage that will have the same forward scheduling dependencies with the stage start date tied to the other stage and thus making the time span grow into the future whenever the number of required workdays is increased. In case you want to flip this into a backward scheduled stage dependency with the stage end date tied to the preceding stage, you can simply reverse the dependency logic by rearranging the linked IDs via drag and drop and updating the dependency connection types in the respective dropdown selections. And now, the more the number of workdays is increased, the earlier the stage has to start. You see, this dependency engine enables you to quickly set up and modify a fully dynamic project schedule and always ensures that a change somewhere in the schedule will make all the dependent items instantly update. In addition, you might have noticed that every stage automatically gets colored with one color group per stage and different color shades for the stage the tasks and the milestone symbol. This is made possible through an automated coloring engine that dynamically creates and applies color codes in the background depending on which color mode is currently selected. Whenever the color mode project structure is selected, the colors are automatically assigned based on the stage ID and the type of item. The available color palette covers eight different color groups that are applied in an infinite loop to ensure that you can add an unlimited amount of stages. The Team Roles color mode allows you to visualize the project based on the respective role that the project team members that are responsible for an item got assigned. Right now, only the project manager C. Miller is available here, but once we open the settings area, we get access to an incredibly powerful project role and team management system. This system allows you to add an unlimited amount of team members to your project and group them into up to eight roles, which can be based on responsibilities, department, or whatever makes sense in your specific case. 
To add new roles to the project, you only need to enter the role name and provide a shortcode. After that, you can add new team members and assign any of the roles that you have just defined on the left. The assignment of roles is automatically tracked in the count column of the role type section. And once you have added your team members to the list, you can jump back to the Gantt worksheet and assign any of the defined team members to your tasks and milestones. The respective role is then automatically displayed and visualized with its own individual color in the Gantt chart. As this coloring is purely based on the project roles and not on individual team members, a team member can easily be replaced by another team member of the same role without any visual disruption. Eventually, in Issues color mode, every item that gets marked with an issue symbol is highlighted in a warning red color and of course you have always the option to deactivate all the coloring by switching into the default color mode. Once you have set up your project schedule, you might want to keep track of the adjustments that you make to that schedule over time. You can document the date of the latest update to the actual project plan and then in order to preserve a snapshot of that plan, open the base plan section. Taking a snapshot is as easy as copying over the start and end date column as values and then documenting the snapshot date. And then when time passes by and you make changes to your actual plan like for example postponing the project start, you now have the actual plan and the original base plan side by side. And you can easily visualize the comparison of both by changing the display mode to the plan versus base comparison. That mode instantly reveals shifted dates and change durations while making sure that the timeline dates perfectly adjust to display both schedules at the same time. Of course, this template also allows you to keep track of the stage, task and milestone completion. Once you set Show Progress to Yes, the percentage completed is beautifully visualized as a filled bar for the stages and tasks and as a finish flag symbol for completed milestones. You can even make the completion of milestones conditionally based on the completion of one or multiple tasks so that the milestone is automatically completed not before the linked task has reached the full 100%. In addition, a standardized formula allows you to automatically update the stage progress based on its items. Eventually, this completion tracking feature is perfectly complemented by the date highlighting option, which allows you to either dynamically highlight today and make overdue items before that line instantly catch your eyes, or alternatively, you can statically highlight any of the dates that are visible in the timeline, and these selectable timeline dates are immediately updated in the drop-down list whenever you scroll the whole Gantt chart area to the right or left which might be especially helpful for projects of longer duration. The whole worksheet is just an amazing tool to set up fully dynamic and easy to manage project schedules. It is created with a focus on lightweight design, outstanding user experience and fast performance. We are gonna build the whole Ultimate Excel Gantt chart template with all these amazing features step by step. The final template file is available for download on excelfind.com Link for that is in the description. And now without further ado, let's get right into it. As the initial step, we need to set up the general design for the Gantt and Settings worksheet. For the Gantt worksheet, we start by setting up the header rows for our input and Gantt chart area. We select these two rows and decrease the general text style to size 10, make it bold and align to the center and middle. After that, we select the range B13 to W13 and give these cells a green fill as this is the row where we're gonna put all the single column headers into. In the row above, we then create section names. Starting with these first columns as the section for IDs, then the next six columns for the item details, then column K to T, is where the actual planning will happen.
while the two following columns will be used to preserve a snapshot of the actual plan at a certain point of time. So we're gonna call this base plan. For both these planning sections, we want to be able to document the dates of an update or the saving of a snapshot. And that's why we make use of these two additional rows here. Make the font for the input field a bit smaller. And just insert a placeholder date value for now. Same for the base plan section. And eventually, let's add some light gray borders to the section cells. For the single column headers, we set the general font color to white and increase the rows height as we need a bit more space here. We start with naming the first columns here as ID, then SID for stage ID and RID for role ID. All of these columns in the ID section will be automatically calculated, so let's color them according to the legend that I have prepared up there and give these cells a lighter green fill. Then the columns for the item type and description are the first actual input columns. This one will be a special column that only contains the indicator colors, so let's give that one an even brighter green fill. The next one is the column for the project roles, which will be automatically computed based on the team member selected in this column. And then as the final column in this section, we make use of the Unicode icons that I have prepared up there. And this one will be the one used to highlight issues that you have with any of your items. In the actual plan section, the most crucial columns are the last two ones, as these will be the calculated start and end date for every single item. These two columns will contain the most crucial formulas in this worksheet and the start and end date calculation will always be based on two types of input. The first one is the number of required workdays for an item and the second one is some sort of date. It can be either a manually entered independent start date or an independent end date or, and this is where the main power of this template will come from, a dependency connection to another item. Such a dependency connection will require a link to the other item's ID, based on which then some crucial information will be extracted in these two columns. And then we have one column to select the type of dependency connection and one to potentially add a lag by which you want the item to be shifted forward or backward. For the best possible user experience, we group these state-related input columns together and make them collapsible. And finally, let's color the snapshot columns that will be used to preserve the start and end date and make these two columns collapsible too. The last column will be used for the progress tracking, so let's put a percentage symbol in there. Now this is the perfect time to quickly adjust the size of the columns to match the expected size of input. And right after that, we can start creating the timeline area. For the timeline, we will create one dark blue row right here. 
And right above that, we're gonna select the cells across these three rows, set the fill to a light blue, make the column really tight, and then merge these three cells together. Set this option to rotate text up, text alignment to the top, and the font size to 8. And now we can just select the whole column and transfer this specific formatting to as many subsequent columns as we wish using the autofill function. And that's already it for the basic design of the header and timeline section here. Wonderful! For a cleaner design, let's hide the default grid lines and add a way better looking custom formatting instead. Initially, we want to visually separate the main sections, so let's hold the control key and select the respective sections, including the header rows and the number of content rows below. With all these selected, we go to the Home tab, open the Border menu and click on More Borders. This will open this Format Cells window in which we can now select a border color like this midlight gray and then specify that we want to add a left and right border. The overall spacing in this sheet here is aimed to perfectly fit into the open window with the actual planning section fully expanded and the base plan section collapsed. So let's do that. And then let's select the whole content area and add some horizontal row-wise borders with an even lighter gray. Perfect! The basic timeline design and size is already defined. So we now know the ideal position for adding a top right settings button that will let us jump straight to the settings worksheet. For the button, we merge these six cells, set the text alignment to center and middle, add a white border around them, and label it settings. After that, we right-click on it and click on Link, which opens this window. As we want to create an internal link inside of the workbook, we go to Place in this document and select the Settings worksheet. We can even define a target cell, so let's choose the cell in the Settings sheet where we're probably gonna place the button for jumping back to the Gantt sheet later. And eventually, I recommend to also define the screen tip, which is the text displayed when hovering over the button. The addition of this link to our button has automatically changed the text format here, so let's fix this and make the text bold, not underlined, and white. Now, with the current setup, only the text itself works as a link, but not the full merged cell area but we can easily change that by activating the Wrap Text option. And now these merged cells perfectly function like we expect a button to do. We are redirected to cell X2 on the Settings worksheet and gonna recreate a similar button that leads back to the Gantt worksheet. So we add the same white borders, Call it Gantt, add a link to the Gantt worksheet, cell BL2, then add a screen tip, and apply the required formatting. And now this works like a charm. We're just gonna increase the size a little bit. And there we go. 
the initial input section that we're going to create in this settings worksheet will be for some basic project details. We add some grey borders around that section. And adjust the column size so that we have two small columns on each side acting as padding and two large columns for creating some input fields. Let's also hide the grid lines on the whole worksheet for a cleaner look and then create multiple input fields for the project title, the project manager and potentially some additional information like for example project priority. We select all of these labels, make them bold, decrease the font size and also add some indent and a light grey border. And then these cells are the actual input fields, which we highlight by adding a light green fill and a similar font size and indent formatting. Let's enter some example values here. Um, the first two are simple text fields. And the project priority field is a good opportunity to quickly demonstrate how to set up a drop down list as one form of data validation for a controlled list of input values. Beautiful. For now, we will reference the project title and project manager directly in the Gantt worksheet. So let's replace this title with the input value from the settings worksheet. And then let's jump over there, add a green label. and an absolute cell reference to the project manager input field. Just like the project manager, we also want to display the project time span, which includes the project start and end date, as well as the project duration. For now we're only going to enter an example date value for the project start date and some placeholder values for the project end date and duration. But later in this tutorial we're going to transform this into a dynamically computed time span. For now we only need the project start date as we need it to set up the timeline values, which basically means that we reference it as the initial date in the timeline and of course make sure it has a clean date formatting. And then for the subsequent date in the timeline we make use of the workday function as we want to entirely focus on actual workdays. The workday function returns a date which is a specified number of workdays after a given start date. So for the start date we simply reference the initial date in the timeline and as we just want to get the next workday here we enter 1 for the number of days and then copy over the date formatting. We can then fill all the subsequent cells in the timeline here with the exact same formula as we have used relative cell references. That looks pretty good. Then in the dark blue row below we want to display the initial weekday letter of the respective date. For that we make use of the text function which is perfectly suited to apply a specified text pattern to a date. So let's reference the date in the cells above and specify the pattern as DDD, 
which returns the initial three weekday letters. As we are only interested in the first letter, we're going to wrap this formula with the left function to cut off the first letter from the left. Let's just decrease the font size and add this formula to all the subsequent cells and that perfectly demonstrates that the timeline dates really only cover the default workdays which are Monday to Friday. Amazing! As the final step of this initial setup, I want to dynamically structure the timeline and chart area based on weeks. So I need to create a visual separation between the weeks that still is correctly displayed even if the timeline is shifted to the left or right. For that, let's create a dynamic name reference first that dynamically references the date cells in the timeline. We select the initial timeline date cell, go to the formulas tab, and click on Define Name. The name of this reference will be simply Date. We set the scope to this worksheet only, so this name reference will only be valid in this scanned worksheet. And then we click into the reference down below, which currently is an absolute cell reference with a dollar sign in front of both the column and the row. By removing this dollar sign in front of the column letter, this name will now dynamically reference the date cell in whatever column it is called from, while the row 10 is fixed. Let me demonstrate that. When we reference the name date from this cell, it references the date cell in the same column. And when we jump over here and reference the name date from this cell, it references the date cell of this column. In a similar manner, we can also create a name that always references the next date in the timeline. All you have to know is the reference you define in the formula below will always be relative to the cell that you had selected at the moment when you have opened the define name window. That means if we now not only remove the dollar sign in front of the column letter, but also change the column letter from X to Y, this name now always references the date cell in the next column. A quick test shows date references the same column date, while next date references the next column's date. We can now define a simple logical test. We check if the weekday of date is greater than the weekday of next date. With the simple workday focus setup that we have in our timeline, this expression should always be true, or when multiplied with 1 it should be 1, for all the cells for which the date in the timeline is a Friday. And once we add that formula to all the cells in this row, this proves to be true. So now we can make use of this expression to dynamically structure the timeline and Gantt area using a conditional formatting rule. We select the option Use Formula to determine which cells to format and pass the formula that we have just created to identify all the cells for which we want to have a light grey right border. That's all we need. We confirm. And as you see, not only does this beautifully add a weak base structuring to this area, but it also works no matter what the start date is. And it would even work if you decided to define custom weekend days or to consider holidays in your Gantt chart. Now let's focus on the basic item details. Uh, before we get into setting these up, let's just make this row here really small to use it as a separator between the header and content. And in addition, let's also set the font size for the whole input area to 10. One of the most crucial input columns is the type selection, as this will decide whether the item is a stage, a task, or a milestone. As we want the user to be able to select from these options, let's create a drop down list by opening the data validation window, selecting list, and then manually entering the three values S for stage, T for task, and M for milestone. 
That way we can now quickly select any of these potential type values. And to make this drop down selection available in each row, we use the autofill handle and simply drag it down. Let's set the text alignment to center. And now we are ready to enter some example items here. So we quickly set up one stage that is called planning with a few task items and a final milestone. And then a second stage called implementation with a similar inner stage structure. As we need to use the values in the type column in some follow-up calculations, let's make that easy to reference by creating a dynamic name reference called type. We set the scope to this worksheet only, and this time, unlike for the date name reference, we're gonna remove the dollar sign in front of the row number in order to make the row dynamically change to whatever row this type name is referenced in. Any formula we're going to use this value in will now be much easier to build and to understand. Let's use this to add a row-based visual structure to the Gantt worksheet that dynamically adjusts based on the item type selected in each row. At first we select the whole Gantt range and add a new conditional formatting rule that is applied in every cell for which the type value in its row equals S. That means we want to particularly highlight every stage row by setting the font style to bold and adding a mid-gray border at the top and bottom. You see, this is instantly applied and beautifully highlights every row for which we select stage as the type. To even further emphasize the fact that all the tasks and milestones are sub-items of the stage, we also want their names automatically indented. For that we create an additional conditional formatting rule for this specific column. This time we want to automatically format all cells for which the type is either T or M. And to create the indented format, we need to go to the number tab jump straight to the custom category and here comes a pretty cool trick because you can represent a text value in a cell by using the add symbol and then we can simply add some space characters in front of that to create the indention. As you see this works beautifully and now we have a clear visualization of the hierarchical structure of our items. On top of all that, a powerful way to visualize the difference between stages and their sub-items is the indicator color column. We can quickly set up the default color indicators by adding two conditional formatting rules to this column. One that's applied whenever type equals S. In that case we want to have that darker gray as the fill color Let's just make this a bit tighter. And then we add another rule that's applied whenever the type is T or M. And that one will add a lighter gray fill color. Beautiful. For an even cleaner formatting, you can remove the border formatting for this particular column. And as the last part of the basic item details, we also want to set up another really simple column. The column that allows you to highlight issues. Here the input selection will be pretty simple. Uh, we're gonna set the text alignment to center. And then create a drop down list that contains this one symbol. That way you don't have to type in anything manually here. You can easily select the symbol for any item that has an issue and once that issue is solved, just use the delete key to remove it again. Simple as that. Now these were the basic item details for which we only had to set up either static drop down selection or simple input fields. 
For the role and team member column, however, we're gonna set up a really advanced, smart and scalable role and team management system that will allow us to manage up to eight project roles and an unlimited amount of team members in the settings area. So let's jump over to the settings worksheet and create a new section for the project role type management, which will require a total of five columns. Let's change the header to a different color, for example, this beautiful green, and add the same gray borderlines that we already used for the project detail section. Then we adjust the size of these columns to have a right and left padding and a bit more space for the input columns. Since we want to create a list in here, we need column headers for which we can simply copy over one of these labels and change the text. The first column will be for the role name and I prefer the text to be aligned to the middle and center. Then we can just duplicate this using the autofill function and change the other headers to code, which is the column to put in a short code that represents the role, and the hash symbol for the column in which we will be automatically counting the number of team members assigned to this specific role. The role and code column are simple text input columns. So let's give them a light green background. And as the count column will be a calculated column, we just set the background to a light gray. I guess it's time to add some example roles in here. Um, the number of input rows is intentionally limited to 8 for two good reasons. First of all, the key idea of these roles is to group your single team members into functional groups in order to remove complexity and get a better overview in case you have a large team. And the second reason is, for a good visualization of different roles with different colors, it is required to have a limited size of the color palette in order to keep them somehow distinguishable. The great advantage of this approach is because we will do the coloring on this role type level, with each role able to have an unlimited number of team members assigned, we could potentially add an unlimited number of team members to the whole project. That's the reason why the project team management section will contain a much larger list. The initial input column will be for the team member name, the second column for the role assignment, and then the third calculated column for automatically displaying the role shortcode. So as I said, we could potentially make this list as large as we want, but for now I'm gonna make it roughly 30 rows so that it still fits onto the screen. Eventually, to close the section at the bottom, let's add these gray borderlines. The name column just requires simple text input. But for the assigned role column, we now want to grab all the defined roles from the other section and make them available in a drop-down list. The important thing here is, we want this drop-down selection to always display only exactly those values that are defined, but not the empty cell values. To create such a dynamic range reference that grows and shrinks based on the number of non-empty cells in a range, we can make use of the offset function. For those of you who are not familiar with this powerful function, I quickly demonstrate it here. The offset function always returns a range that starts at a starting reference. Then we could add a row or column offset, which we don't need in our case, but we need to define the height dynamically by counting the number of non-empty items in the maximum possible range. And for that we can use the count a function. As you see, this perfectly returns a dynamic array with exactly all those non-empty values and once I add another entry, the array grows accordingly. And when I remove it, the array shrinks again. We can now use this formula directly to define a data validation dropdown list. So let's open the data validation window, select list, and then for the source, we use the offset function with a starting reference, then skipping the next two arguments, 
and then defining the height as the number of non-empty items in that range. As you see, exactly those five roles defined are now selectable here in every row. When we remove an entry, the drop-down selection adjusts accordingly, which is simply amazing. Eventually, for the code column here, we want to automatically display the respective shortcode based on the selected role. For such a task, Excel offers a wide range of lookup functions, but the go-to formula that I prefer and recommend is the good old index match. For those of you unfamiliar with this formula, the index function requires you to select a range from which you want a value to be returned. And then to allocate a specific value in this one column range, the second required input is a row number. And in order to get the correct row number, we can use the match function, which simply looks up a lookup value, in our case, that is the assigned role, in a lookup array, which is the role column here, and it has to be an exact match. So the match function returns the correct row number for the index function, which then returns the correct short code. Simple as that. Now let's see what happens once we add this formula to the row below. We get an NA error, as no role is selected here. Now as this doesn't look too pretty, let's catch this error by wrapping the formula with the ifNA function which allows us to return an alternative value in case this error occurs. Now we can add it to all the other rows and also add some additional team members. You see, the correct code instantly appears once we assign one of the defined roles. That is amazing. The final column that we have not taken care of so far is the column to automatically count the number of team members assigned to each role. And for this one, we first check if the role cell is non-empty, because otherwise there's obviously nothing to count. And in case it is non-empty, we use the COUNTIF function to count the number of values in that role range that equals the role defined in this list. Otherwise, we simply return an empty text string. We add this formula to all rows and instantly have an overview about the role distribution. Whenever we now add a team member and assign a role, this count is updated correctly, which is great. Eventually, to give both these lists a more list-like appearance, I like to add some white separating horizontal borderlines between the cells. That looks pretty good. And now we are ready to jump straight back to the Gantt worksheet where we're gonna make use of these smart lists. Over here, we now want to be able to select a team member via a dynamic drop-down list and then automatically display the according role right next to it. Let's add this team member drop-down list by applying the same exact technique that we have used just a minute before. So again, to create a dynamic range reference, we enter the offset function with the first cell in the name column of the team member section. Then we skip the next two arguments and then use the count a function to count the number of non-empty cells in the whole team member name column. Now we can easily assign the defined team members to these task and milestone items. And in order to automatically display their respective role, we only need to look up the selected name in the project team member list and return the role shortcode. For this, let's first set up a dynamic name reference for the team member, just as we did before for the type, call it team member, scope is this worksheet, and to make it dynamic, we are gonna remove the dollar sign again. And then to look up the respective row, we define an index match formula that is wrapped in an ifNA function. The return array is the short code column of the project team member list. And to get the correct row, we apply the match function to look up the team member in this name column as an exact match. In case this returns an NA error, let's just return an empty string again. 
And once we add this formula to all the rows using autofill, we see that this perfectly works. Let's just decrease the font size and change the color to a gray tone. And also add some indent. We can even increase the size of this column a little bit. And now this is an almost perfect implementation of this team member and role assignment. There's only one last thing that I want to add to this feature to make it fully complete. For this I jump back to the settings worksheet and I see at first we need to delete one column here to make the Gantt button come back to its original place as we obviously have added one additional column in the process. Okay. Now the thing I want to add is a user friendly way of removing team members from the project which might happen from time to time. Removing a team member like Y Lin here is no problem. But what if the team member you deleted here is currently assigned to an item in the Gantt worksheet? Well you see the role is empty because the lookup results in an NA error. But the name is still written in the cell. So I think it is very helpful to visually indicate that this team member is no longer part of the team. And the item potentially has to be reassigned. So my idea here is to add a conditional formatting rule. That checks if a match function lookup of that name in the name list returns an NA error using the isNA function. And if that is the case, we change the font color to a warning red. Exactly like this. So now when we add this team member back to the list, There is no warning. And once this team member is removed again, we get the indication that we might need to reassign this item. Amazing! Now that we have set up the full item details section, let's start implementing the basic manual planning with independent start or end dates. The most crucial columns for the actual plan will be these two calculated columns for the start and end date. Because all the date related visualization in the chart area will be based on these two columns. The reason why the start and end date need to always be calculated is that we're gonna have different input options. As previously mentioned the calculation of the start and end date will always be based on two inputs. One input is the number of required workdays. And the second input is either an independent start date, an independent end date or a dynamic start or end date that is dependent on another item. Of these two calculated start and end date columns, one will always be defined directly from the date section and then the other one will be calculated based on that and the defined number of workdays. Before we start setting this up, Let's make sure that all the date columns including the base plan columns have the same clean date format. I prefer this custom date format and for the workday column we make sure that the content is aligned to the center. Let's start with setting up the simplest of all options which is providing an independent start date and the number of required workdays. In order to make these cell values easy to reference in other formulas, we define dynamic name references for the independent start date. Always keep in mind to remove the dollar sign in front of the row number. And then we do the same for the workdays. But this time we not only make it dynamic, but we also want to make sure that this name reference will always have a default value of 1 in case the cell is empty. We can easily do that by returning the maximum of the cell value and 1. This has two big advantages. First of all, it is guaranteed that an item will become instantly visible once either a start or end date is provided, even before the number of workdays is entered. And second, we don't need to actively enter a workday number for milestones. 
as we will need to reference the calculated plan start and plan end for the Gantt chart visualization, let's also add dynamic name references for these. I explicitly call them plan start and plan end, as these will be the ones that will always represent the actual plan in one constant place. All right, the formula for the plan start in this scenario is pretty simple. We first check if the independent start date is non-empty and if that is the case, we return the independent start date, otherwise an empty string. So this is the date directly taken from the input section, while the plan end date has to be calculated based on the plan start and the work days. In a similar manner, we also check if int start is non-empty because only then the plan start is also non-empty. And then we're gonna make use of the workday function, put in the plan start as start date and add the workdays minus one. So in this example, nine workdays to this plan start. The reason why we have reduced this number by one is that the plan start date is already one of these 10 workdays. So the plan end date is only nine workdays later. The alternative value in case int start is empty is again simply an empty string. Let's do a quick check if the calculation is correct by looking at the timeline. As you see, the 10th to the 21st of May are exactly a 10 workday time span, so it works correctly. When we take a closer look at this formula, there are two crucial things we always have to keep in mind. First, every time we calculate one of these plan dates by adding or subtracting the workdays from the other date, it is crucial that we're gonna reference the other calculated plan date and not the input date, like int start in this case, directly. Because otherwise we're gonna end up creating circular references at some point. And the second aspect to consider, as both these formulas will get a lot more complex over time and also gonna reuse certain calculations, it is advisable to transform all subcalculations in here into what I call named calculations. What that means is that instead of entering these subcalculations directly into the formula itself, we're gonna create names for them in the name manager. And only have to reference the name in the bigger formula for the same exact result. That not only makes the bigger formulas easier to read and the subcalculations reusable, but also allows us to manage and potentially adjust each subcalculation at one central place in the name manager. Now let's use this to manually set up the schedule for the tasks and milestone of this stage. As you see, as soon as we have entered the independent start date, the plan start and plan end are instantly displayed as the workday's value is set to one by default. And for the milestone, we only need to enter the independent start date and can leave the workday cell empty because we want the milestone to start and end on one particular date. Perfect. With this example schedule set up, we can now create the default visualization in the chart area right below the timeline. We have all the information prepared that we need to decide if an item is within its plan in a given cell because we now know what the plan start is, what the plan end is, and what a respective date in the timeline is. These name references work correctly from every cell in this chart area, no matter which one you take. To figure out if a cell should display something or not, all we need to do is check if the date is within the plan time span. So if the date is greater equal the plan start and smaller equal the plan end. This formula returns either true or false and for demonstration purposes, let's display that as either a one or a zero by multiplying it with one. We can use the autofill handle to add this formula to the whole row. And as you see, this displays a one in each cell belonging to the defined plan time span. When we add this to all the rows, we can verify it works perfectly for all the defined items. Amazing. 
For this formula again, it makes sense to transform it into a named calculation. So let's copy it and create a new name that is called item in plan. Set the scope to this worksheet and paste the formula. It is simple as that. Now we can replace this formula and have one short expression that works in every cell of this Gantt chart area. And that is all we need to implement the default visualization. One big goal of this template is to have the stages, the tasks and milestones all differently visualized. And while the stages and tasks can be perfectly visualized using a cell color fill without any written cell content, we want the milestone to display an actual milestone symbol. For that purpose, I have prepared two Unicode icons, this one for an open and this one for a completed milestone. And for now, this symbol for the open milestone has to be somehow written into the cell. So let's copy over this Unicode icon and start building the milestone visualization as an in-cell formula. In the formula, we only have to check two conditions that have to be true. First, the type has to be a milestone. And the item has to be in plan in this cell. If that's the case, we just print this milestone symbol, otherwise an empty text string. Let's add this formula to the full range. We instantly see the milestone symbol is printed on the correct day. And in addition, we're going to align the cell content to the middle and center and slightly increase the font size. Perfect. For the stages and tasks, on the other hand, we want to create Gantt bars by filling the respective cell backgrounds with some color. And for that, we can directly jump into the Conditional Formatting Rule Manager and create two new rules. Let's create a default rule for the stages. Just like for the milestones, this formula checks if the type is a stage and if the item is in plan in the respective cell. If both these conditions are true, we want to add this darker gray background fill color to the cell. Let's apply this rule and you can see the stage is now perfectly visualized as a dark gray bar. So let's move this rule down in the rule order, which simply means that this rule is now applied after the two other rules. And then we duplicate this rule to create a similar rule with a lighter gray for the tasks. Once we apply this rule, both the stages and tasks are now beautifully visualized. The only thing left now is we also want a similar gray coloring for the milestone symbol. So let's jump back to the Conditional Formatting Rules Manager, duplicate one of these two rules, then change the type condition to milestone. And this time we don't want to control the cell fill, so we clear that first. Instead, we jump to the Font tab and change the font color to this darker gray. I decided to make this milestone symbol color match the stage color to better stand out. And once applied, now all these type visualizations are in perfect harmony. Beautiful. Now before we close this conditional roots formatting manager, I need to show you two concepts in here that are crucial in terms of worksheet efficiency. At first, always add a check in this stop if true checkbox if a rule and all the following rules are mutually exclusive. What that means is in this case, if the stage coloring rule here is applied because its conditions are true, then the two following rules don't have to be checked because they cannot be true at the same time. That will save you a lot of computational resources, especially with a larger number of rules in here. And the second concept somehow builds upon this stop if true feature and is even more crucial. When we take a look at these default coloring rules, we see that each of these does the same item in plan check. That is super inefficient as we do the same condition check over and over again. 
and to avoid this, we can add one additional rule that does this item in plan check once at the beginning and only if the cell passes this test, we continue with looking at the following rules. That's why I call this a stopper rule. Because what we do in this new rule, we're gonna check the opposite of the condition that we want to be true. So in this case, we check if not item in plan. We don't need any formatting here. Just click OK, place it right on top of these coloring rules, and then activate that stop if true checkbox. So now if the item is not in plan in a cell, the following rule conditions won't be checked because it is not required. And the stopper rule now allows us to simplify the coloring rules by removing the item in plan condition. And that leaves us with the type check here. And now this whole setup is super efficient and we are perfectly prepared for scaling this with some additional coloring rules later. Great! Now that we have set up the default visualization, let's take a look at the other manual scheduling option, which is instead of entering an independent start date and doing a forward scheduling, entering an independent end date and doing a backward scheduling. Let's reproduce the same exact time span for this stage by entering the end date that is calculated in the plan and cell at the moment, which is the 21st of May. At the moment, the plan start and plan end formulas are only able to work with the independent start date input and that's why they now show nothing but an empty cell and the visualization is also gone. But we're gonna change that in a second. First, we're gonna create a dynamic named reference for the int end date. And then jump straight into these formulas. This time, we start by modifying the plan and formula at first. Instead of returning an empty string, if int start is empty, we now continue with a second if statement that checks if int end is non-empty. Because if that is the case, we want to directly get the value of int end and only otherwise we're gonna return an empty text string. That works like a charm, so let's also update the formula in the other rows of that column. And as you see, this time the plan start has to be calculated backwards based on the plan end. So let's add the same logic here. First, checking if int end is non-empty. And if that is the case, use the workday function. Put in the plan end as the start date of that calculation and then add a negative number of workdays. So we multiply the workdays by minus one and since the end date is already one of these 10 workdays, we have to add one again to make it only go back nine workdays. And otherwise, if int end is empty, we just return the empty text string. We now have successfully reproduced the exact same time span that we had before. So again, let's take that sub calculation and create a new named calculation that we call plan start calculation. Let's update the other rows in the plan start column and test if it works in the other rows just as fine. And as you see, we can easily recreate these time spans by providing only independent end dates. That's amazing. We have intentionally implemented both these formulas for the plan end and plan start using a hierarchical logic. That means these formulas are written in a way that the int start value will always override the int end value. So once we enter an int start value, the int end value will just be ignored. That is really important as it makes sure that there is no confusion which value is taken if multiple input dates are provided at once. 
However, at the moment this logical hierarchy is not instantly obvious when only looking at the int start and int end columns. So what we do to make this super intuitive is we are gonna add a conditional formatting rule to the int end column that simply checks if int start is non-empty. Because if that is true, then the int n value is basically inactive, not used, and we indicate that by giving it a mid-gray font color. There we go. Now when I enter an int start date, the respective int end date is automatically grayed out, and I instantly know which one of both is currently active. Let's overwrite the stage and task items with the original int start dates, leave the milestone defined via the int end date, and then we quickly set up a plan for the second stage, with the stage and the first task using a forward scheduling, and the other two tasks being backward scheduled. Here you can perfectly see how the bar now grows backwards as soon as we set the number of workdays to a number that is bigger than 1. Same for the next task. And for the milestone again, it is enough to only provide a date. Great! Now it's the perfect time to show you how you can quickly automate the stage calculations and visualization based on its items. As we have no intention to overwrite the calculated plan start and plan end formulas, the clean approach here is to work with some simple formulas in the input section. For that, I have prepared two standardized placeholder formulas that are super easy to use. All you need to do is copy this formula into the int start cell of a stage, and then replace this placeholder with the plan start range of the items in that stage. And in the same manner, we can dynamically calculate the number of workdays using this placeholder formula, which references the plan start and then calculates the net workdays between this plan start and the maximum of these items' plan end dates. We are now free to change any of these task or milestone schedules. The stage time span will always be automatically updated. That is amazing, but I think the usage of formulas in these input cells somehow makes it necessary to highlight an input cell whenever a formula is used. So for that, let's add a new conditional formatting rule to that int start column that checks if the cell contains a formula. Let's make the cell reference fully relative. And the formatting I think that makes sense in this case is this strong blue font color. Because this is a color that we are commonly familiar with from links, for example from websites or documents, and in a way these formulas link to other cells. Let's also include the workdays column into this rule. And that makes these formula inputs clearly distinguishable from regular input. Once we have used such an auto stage formula in one stage, we can simply copy it over to another stage since the range reference is relative. It just perfectly covers all these included items directly. In case you have a different number of items in that other stage, all you need to do is adjust this referenced range with your mouse and you are good to go. And the same for the auto stage workday formula. What is really amazing about this general setup we can now collapse the date input columns and have the workdays as key information still visible. And now whenever we adjust the number of required workdays for a task, there is no need to manually update the stage workdays as they are updated automatically. As this auto stage workdays calculation is not simply adding up all the workdays of its items, but actually computing the maximum time span of all items, it is fully able to handle whenever items overlap within that time span. 
Eventually, while for the auto stage workdays it makes sense to display the actual number, I think for the auto stage int start value, we can make it even more obvious that this is not a real int start date by adding an additional rule that only focuses on this column and is also limited to stage rows only. So whenever a cell is in a stage row and is a formula, Instead of displaying the date itself, a really cool trick is to just override it with a text value. So no matter what the date is, it will display the text auto. Let's set the text alignment to center. And I think that is a beautiful and intuitive setup. This manual planning with independent start or end dates is pretty helpful, but it is nothing compared to what we're gonna build now. Because now we're gonna add the core feature of this template, which is an intuitive and super powerful dependency engine that allows you to make your project plan fully dynamic. We're gonna implement all four possible types of dependency connections that you can have between items, so this step will transform this scan chart from a good looking project visualization tool into a professional project planning tool. This right here is the section that will allow you to quickly create all kinds of dependency connections between items. We're gonna build up the whole dependency logic based on the second task P2. Now instead of relying on one of these manually defined independent dates, we're gonna make that task dependent on task P1. So let's clear all these inputs for the subsequent items, remove the independent end dates, and since we want to make this task P2 dependent on the task P1, we're also gonna remove the independent start date for this one. The workdays can just stay in there as we're gonna use them in the same way as we did before. Let's also temporarily move the timeline one week to the right, so that not only the forward-looking dependencies, but also the backward-looking dependencies are instantly visualized once they are implemented. The key idea for making an item dependent on another item is that you will have to link to the other item's ID. This obviously requires us to create a reliable ID system in advance. And for that, we start by defining a dynamic name reference for the cells in this column. Call it ID, set a scope, and as usual, remove the dollar sign in front of the row number. As we don't want to manually enter any IDs, we somehow need them to be automatically created and self-sustaining in case we insert or delete a certain row. That means we want to have an ID system in which each ID dynamically represents the position of its items row in the whole list of items as a unique number. The straightforward solution of simply entering and autofilling a sequence of numbers directly is not sufficient in that case because as soon as we insert a row and use the fill down option, we get duplicates in here and would need to manually update all the subsequent IDs again. In the same manner, setting the first ID to one and then for all subsequent IDs, just referencing the previous ID and incrementing it by one is also not fully working. As the ID below the inserted row unfortunately keeps referencing the same ID. In addition, both of these very simple solutions would get absolutely destroyed as soon as you delete the initial row. So we have to create something that is way more robust and self-sustaining. The key for achieving that is to give each cell all the information about the previous values in its column. We can easily create a named range that we call brief call range, short for previous column range, and define it as a range starting from the header cell and ending at the cell right above. At the moment, this is a fixed range, but removing the dollar sign in front of the last cell's row gonna make this a range that will dynamically grow and shrink depending on the cell from which it is referenced. Furthermore, as we might make use of this in other columns as well, let's also remove the dollar signs in front of the column's letter. Whenever you have defined a name that refers to a range or cell, you can easily check what it is currently referring to by opening the name manager, selecting the defined name and clicking into the formula below. You see with this cell selected, it refers to the exact range that we need. 
The reason why we included the header in here is because that ensures that even if we insert a row on top of the initial row, it will become part of that range and not be excluded. Now we can use that to enter the formula that will dynamically create the correct ID for each row. In this formula, we first need to check if this is the initial row in the list of items. That's the case whenever the row of the cell itself equals the row of the header plus 2. 2 because we have the separator row in between, so the initial row will always be 2 cells below the header cell. If that is the case, the ID has to be 1. And for all the subsequent cells for which that is not the case, we simply compute the maximum of the previous column range and increment it by 1. Simple as that. Let's drag the autofill handle down to add it to all rows in this column. And that looks good so far. But the actual power of this becomes visible once we insert a row and fill the values down. You see, all the ID values get perfectly updated to correctly represent their new position in the list. Even if I would insert a row above the first row and use the fill up option, it is also correctly updated. So that gives us an automated and robust ID system that is not instantly destroyed whenever we forget to manually update it. Now we can jump over to the dependency section and make task P2 link to the ID of task P1. This link should always be created by actually referencing the respective ID cell in order to make sure that the linked ID number is correctly updated in case the other item's ID changes due to an inserted or deleted row. To help you instantly see if the linked ID is an actual cell reference and not just a fixed number typed in, we make use of the conditional formatting rule that gives the cell content a blue font color in case it contains a formula. We increase the range by adding a comma and selecting this column. And now this referenced ID is colored blue, which tells us it links to another cell. A super powerful advantage of referencing the other item's ID is that it couldn't be easier to make this task dependent on a different item because you can simply click into the cell and drag the reference to another ID. Okay, now that we have found a way to create a robust link to another item's ID, let's make this cell value dynamically referenceable as D.ID, where the D stands for dependent. And the initial thing that we want to do with this ID is to extract some fundamental information about the other item. The first information we are interested in is the position of the other item. So is it positioned above or below this item's row? This information can be really helpful as an indication for either a forward scheduling dependency or a backward scheduling dependency. And to indicate that visually, we're gonna make use of these two Unicode arrow icons. The formula for this is quite straightforward. At first, we check if d.id is non-empty. And if that is the case, we only have to check if d.id is smaller than this item's ID, which means it's positioned above this item and we insert a placeholder for arrow up. And alternatively, in case d.id is greater than this item's ID, the other item is obviously positioned below this item, so here we want to display the arrow down. And as fallback option, we just return an empty text string. Let's jump to the Unicode icons and copy over the arrow up, paste it to replace the placeholder, and then we do the same for the arrow down. Perfect. Let's also decrease the font size, set the text alignment to center, and adjust the size of the column. And that gives us a beautiful indicator for the position of the linked item. In the next column, we want to automatically display the type and name of the linked item. This is a classic lookup problem, so we can use the match function to look up DID in the ID column to get the correct row number. And then use the index function to return the respective value from either this or this column. As we're gonna need the row number of the other item at multiple occasions, let's just start with the match part and make it a named calculation. 
for the lookup value, we pass d.id. Then for the lookup array, we can pass the whole column B as an absolute reference with dollar signs, and we need to have an exact match. This returns 16 in this example, which indeed is the row number of the linked item. So let's copy that formula and transform it into a named calculation that we call d.row. Perfect. For extracting the other item's type, we use the index function to take a look at the column E and return the value from the row calculated in D row. That seems to work correctly. Let's change DID to reference the milestone. That also works like a charm. So we can save this calculation as D.type. And for the linked item's name, it's basically the same approach. Let's call it D.name. Paste the formula we just used and replace column E with column F. Now we have both this information about the other item available as a named calculation. Let's also decrease the font size a bit and change the font color of all these information to this dark gray to show these are secondary lookup information. And now we can create a concatenated string that contains dtype in brackets, followed by dname. Amazing! But once we add this to some rows that have no DID reference, this will result in an NA error. So in order to catch this and potential other arrows, let's wrap this expression in an if arrow function. One additional aspect to consider is that the other item's name could potentially be way longer, like this for example. So the extracted text in the D item column would extend into the subsequent columns. And to avoid that, I recommend to adjust this formula Instead of just directly printing the full name, we're first going to check if the length of this name exceeds a certain threshold, for example, seven characters. And in case it really exceeds that threshold, we're going to apply the left function to extract the first threshold number of characters, so in that case, seven, followed by some dots. And otherwise, we can simply print the full name. So now this long name is cut off at exactly that threshold. And once we increase the column size a little bit, everything now perfectly fits in. And as soon as that threshold is not longer exceeded, the dots disappear correctly and we have the full name displayed. Perfect. Let's do a final test for the whole D item output by changing the referenced ID once again. And the information we get are exactly those that we expect to see. Great, let's move on to the heart of the dependency engine, which is the selection of the type of dependency connection we want to have. In the column d.con, we add a dropdown list that lets us select one of four different connection types. Finish to start, start to start, start to finish, and finish to finish. The first letter always refers to the other item and the second letter to this item. So finish to start means that this item starts the next day after the other item has finished. So the plan start date of this item is determined by the plan end date of the other item. And as this makes the plan start tied to another date, an increasing number of required workdays will make this task grow forward. Start to start means that this item starts the same day the other item starts, so this item's plan start is tied to the other item's plan start, which also means it grows forward with an increasing number of required workdays. Start to finish now means that this item has to finish right before the other item starts. So this time the plan end date of this item is tied to the other item's plan start date, which means an increase in required workdays makes this item grow backwards. 
And eventually, finish to finish means that this item finishes the same day the other item finishes, so this item's plan end date is tied to the other item's plan end date. And with an increasing number of required workdays, it also grows backwards. A great way to provide some basic information and instructions for an input column like this is to select the header cell, then open the data validation window without adding an actual data validation. What we are interested in instead is the input message tab, which allows us to enter an informative message that is displayed whenever this cell is selected. I'll just enter some basic information about the four dependency connection types. And now this information is available here whenever I need it. The column next to this will allow us to define a lag by which we want this item to be shifted to the right in case we have a positive value or to the left with a negative value. Let's set the text alignment to center for both these columns. Adjust the column size. And create a dynamic name reference for both these columns. We call the first one d.con and make the row relative and then we do the same for d.lag. With this we now have all the values and information available that we need to make this dependency logic part of the plan start and plan end formula. I hope you remember the hierarchical logic that I talked about earlier, which basically was that both the plan start and plan end formula always start by taking a look at the int.start value, and only if that cell is empty, they consider the int end value, and only if that cell is also empty, they will now consider the dependency section and do the date calculations based on what is in here. So let's start with the plan start formula and replace this empty string with a completely new expression. What we need to do first is to check if d.id is non-empty. Otherwise there is nothing that could be calculated here. And in case it is non-empty, then we can take a look at what connection type is selected. For the plan start formula, we are only interested in those dependency connection types that will make the start date tied to the other item. The first one of these is the classic finish to start dependency. In that case, we want to do the respective calculation for which we simply enter a placeholder for now. And alternatively, if the selected dependency connection type is start to start, we want to do the respective start to start calculation. In case it is one of the other two dependency connection types, then we know that the plan end date will be tied to the other item's date and we need to do the backward calculation based on the plan end date and the number of required workdays. And guess what? This is something that we have already defined as the plan start calculation. What a great coincidence! Now we only have to close these brackets for the last two if statements, then provide a fallback value in case DID is empty and eventually close that bracket as well. For now, with finish to start or start to start selected here, the respective placeholder appears correctly. And once we select one of the other two types, we get this value error because right now the formula assumes that the plan end date is already available, which is not the case yet. To catch these errors in general for this huge formula, let's wrap it inside an if error statement just to make sure it will always display an empty string in such a case. For the plan end formula, we're gonna implement the same exact pattern. Instead of returning an empty string here, we first go to check if d.id is non-empty. And if that is the case, we now check if d.con equals one of the other two dependency connection types, which are start to finish and alternatively finish to finish. Otherwise, in case it is one of the other two values, we need to calculate the plan end based on the plan start and the number of required workdays, which is already covered in the plan end calculation. Let's close both these if statements 
enter a fallback value in case d.id is empty. And we can also directly wrap the whole formula in an if error function to catch potential errors. The basic logic of when to do which calculation is now implemented. When switching between different values of dcon, the placeholders perfectly show us which of the plan start or plan end is the one that is calculated based on the other item. This allows us to proceed with replacing these placeholder calculations with some actual calculations. And for the beginning, we're going to remove this lag value here to avoid any confusion. For the finish to start calculation, we need to set the plan start date to the workday after the plan end date of the other item. So we want this date to be one workday after this one plus a potential lag. The workday function is the one that allows us to do exactly this calculation. We only need to somehow grab this value, but as we already know the row of the other item, we can simply return this value using the index function by entering column T as the return array and D row as the row. With this, we now have a start date defined in the workday function and only need to specify the number of workdays we want to add to this date. As for this finish to start dependency connection, we are looking for the next workday plus a potential lag. We're going to enter one plus D dot lag and close the workday statement. At first glance, it seems to perfectly work. The plan start is correctly calculated and thus also the plan end can be calculated based on the plan start and the workdays. When we add a lag to this dependency connection, the second task is shifted to the right or to the left accordingly. And the most important aspect, when we change the duration of the first task, the plan dates of the second task are updated correctly so that the second task always starts right after the first one has finished. Perfect. For the start to start calculation, we can now simply copy over that formula as we only need to do some tiny adjustments. For this one, we want both items to start together. So this time, instead of grabbing the other items plan end date, we now need to grab the other items plan start date from column S. And for the days argument, we are gonna remove the one because by default, it now is not the next, but the same day that we wanna have and we only want to shift it by a potentially given lag. When we now make this a start to start dependency connection, both items perfectly start together. Changing the other items duration in this example has no impact, but changing the other items independent start date makes both perfectly move together. For a better maintainability and less complexity in this huge formula, Let's transform both these expressions into named calculations. The first one will be called FS calculation. And the second one accordingly, SS calculation. And that way we have now transformed this huge amount of calculation logic and functionality into a relatively small and understandable set of commands. Let's jump right over to the plan and formula because here we now gonna create similar expressions for these two dependency connection types. For the start to finish calculation, we now want to have the plan end date of this item one day before the plan start of the other item, plus a potential lag of course. That means we're gonna make use of the workday function again and as the date to start with, we're gonna grab the other item's plan start by applying the index function to column S with d.row as the return row. And since we want to calculate the workday right before that date, we add minus one this time plus the potential value in d lag. Let's close that statement, hit enter and change the dependency connection to start to finish and it works like a charm. When we change the start date of the other item, both items perfectly stay tied together through this connection. And also adding a positive or a negative lag works just like it should. Eventually, for the finish to finish dependency connection type, let's copy over this expression 
and you probably already know the adjustments we're gonna make. We're gonna remove the minus one and grab the other item's date from column T instead of column S as we need the plan and date. That way both items now will finish together on the same day but potentially shifted by a given lag. This also works as it should. Now both plan and dates are dynamically tied together. Adding a lag value also produces the wanted result. And now we can transform both these new expressions in the plan and formula into two named calculations. The first one called SF calculation. And the other one accordingly, FF calculation. Let's insert these named calculations instead of the full formulas and do a final checkup if everything still works correctly. That looks pretty good. In this whole dependency logic, there is only one thing that we haven't considered so far. And that is, what if no dependency connection type is selected, so the cell here is empty. With the given setup, that will result in a circular reference, which is why we get this warning. And the reason for this circular reference is, both the plan start and plan and formulas try to calculate their dates based on each other, as neither of them is able to find one of their two relevant dependency connection types in there. So the plan start calculation and the plan end calculation are executed at the same time. The good news are, we can easily avoid this by setting a default value in case d.con is empty. In my opinion, finish to start is the most intuitive choice here and the quickest way to make this the default value is by saying, apply the finish to start calculation for the plan start, either if dcon equals fs or d.con equals nothing, so an empty string. That way, finish to start is always the default choice in case no different value is selected. We now have successfully built the whole dependency logic, so we can decrease the height of this formula bar up here again, update all the cells in the plan start and plan end column with the newly built formulas, do the same for the D item columns, and since finish to start is the default value in the dependency calculation, I suggest to just paste it as an actual value for all cells by default and then make these columns behind the DID column invisible as long as no DID is referenced. We can achieve that with one simple conditional formatting rule. This rule will check if DID is empty and in that case sets the font color to white. That way nothing is visible as long as DID is empty and both the D item and the D con value magically appear once we put a reference into the DID column. In my opinion that makes the user experience way better. Eventually let's remember the logical hierarchy for which input date to consider that we have built into both the plan start and plan and formula. With these updated versions of both formulas, the dependency functionality has the last place in this hierarchy, which means it is overwritten by both the int end date and int start date, just like the int end date is overwritten by the int start date. For the dependency connection this means it becomes inactive if at least one of the int start or int end date is non-empty. So let's add the same graying out conditional formatting to the dependency section as we already did for the independent end date column. This rule checks if at least one of the int start or int date is non-empty. In case that is true, we set the font color to this mid gray and we can see as this rule is currently executed as the top rule, it makes the decon values appear again. So let's just move it below this rule here that ensures the font color is white if DID is empty. We click apply again and the problem is solved. Great! Let's do some example planning with the dependency engine for all the items that we have set up so far. 
We gonna make this task dependent on the preceding task with a simple finish to start dependency and see how the task has one workday by default and as soon as we enter a number higher than that, it grows to the right. In a similar manner, we could now make the milestone dependent on that last task in that stage by referencing ID 4. But in cases like that where we simply want to have consecutive item dependencies, there's a beautiful shortcut you can use, which is the autofill function. Simply select the d.id of the preceding item and then drag this autofill handle down. And since this is a relative reference in there, this autofilled reference now links to the next ID, which is 4. For milestones, I generally prefer a finish to finish dependency as a milestone is often logically tied to the successful completion of one or multiple tasks. For the second stage, we can start by copying over the auto stage formulas because we already know the amount of items in that stage. In case that stage had a different number of items, we could easily just click into the formula and adjust the referenced range to cover all of the items. And the same for the auto stage workday formula. Using this stage, I want to demonstrate how you can easily make a stage dependent on another stage. For example, with a finish to start dependency connection, all you have to do is to determine which one is the initial item in the second stage, then link this item to the first stage and make the subsequent items directly or indirectly dependent on the initial item. For consecutive dependencies within the stage, we only have to link the second item to the first one and then we can use the autofill function to create consecutive dependencies for the last two items. Let's change the milestones dependency connection type to finish to finish and enter the number of required workdays for the tasks. See how easy that was? Both these stages are now tied together and every change that impacts the first stage's plan end date, like for example an increased duration or change in dependency structure within that stage, will make the second stage automatically adjust its schedule accordingly. Now that was a classic forward scheduling dependency connection between stages, because we have made the start of the second stage dependent on the other stage. We can also create a backward scheduling dependency for these stages by making the plan end date of the second stage dependent on the other stage, for example as a finish to finish dependency, that would mean the stage end date is fixed and every increase in duration of this stage would make the stage grow backwards. To achieve that, we have to reverse the dependency logic in that second stage. Initially, we determine a final item in that stage, in this case this would most likely be the milestone, then link this final item to the other stage and make all the other items of that stage directly or indirectly dependent on that one. So we update these dependencies accordingly by clicking into the DID cell of the milestone and dragging it to the ID of the first stage. Now this is connected to the first stage with a finish to finish dependency. Then we make that last task dependent on that milestone with a finish to finish dependency. And for the upper two tasks, we can use the autofill function again and only have to update the dependency connection type to start to finish for both of them. Whenever we increase the duration of these items, the whole stage now grows backwards and we need to start earlier. Of course, once the plan end date of the first stage is moved to the right into the future, that will now move both the plan start and plan end of the second stage back to the right again. For the sake of completeness, let's also transform this back into a stage finish to start dependency connection by updating the initial items DID to link to the first stage again, make the subsequent items consecutively dependent on that initial one and change all the dependency connection types for the tasks back to finish to start. As you see, even these fundamental changes in the dependency structure of that schedule can be done within a few seconds. That's amazing. Let's also take a quick look at how to extend the stage with additional items. Let's add two additional tasks and one milestone to the second stage. The first thing you should do in case you have applied the auto stage formulas, click into them and adjust the referenced range to also cover these new items. Same for the workdays to enable the stage to cover the full stage time span. 
For simple consecutive relationships, we use the autofill handle, then change the milestone dependency connection to finish to finish and enter the number of required workdays for the tasks. Be aware that this is just a simple example. You are totally free to always transform this into a way more complex dependency structure. For example, we can make this task i4 start together with the initial task simply by updating the linked ID and switching to a start to start dependency connection. Now a change in duration of these two tasks not necessarily has an impact on the overall stage duration, as these tasks run in parallel now. Or let's say we want both of these milestones to finish at the same day and figure out what does that implicate for the required start date of the last two tasks. Let's make this milestone dependent on the other one. And these two tasks now dependent on that second milestone with a finish to finish. And for this one, a start to finish dependency. Given this setup, once we increase the number of workdays here, we now just have to start earlier. And now this even has an impact on the stage time span. All these examples are only a small fraction of all the possible dependency structures you can build, so the opportunities with this dependency engine feature are basically endless. As quick as we had added these three items within seconds, we can also delete them. You see, the IDs on the left perfectly update, the reference ranges of the auto stage formulas also do not require a manual update, and as we have just deleted a few of these content rows and now only have 16 left at the moment, we can easily add new ones anytime just by selecting the last row and using the autofill feature. As soon as we have more potential rows in this Gantt chart than fitting on the screen, we would need to scroll down in order to see all of them. But instead of applying the scrolling to the whole worksheet, I recommend to scroll to the top once, then select the initial row of the Gantt area, go to the View tab and click on Freeze Panes to freeze the header including the separator row. Now only the Gantt area below the header is moved when we scroll and that way it is way more user friendly. Before we continue, let's use this additional space for adding two more stages to this Gantt chart. We call this one Rollout Prep. and make it dependent on the second stage with a finish to finish dependency connection. So this stage is affected by changes in both the second and the first stage. And then we add another stage called rollout that will just start right after the rollout prep stage has finished. It is simply amazing how quickly the setup of a fully dynamic project plan can be done with this feature as it's incredibly intuitive, fast and easy to use. And another amazing thing is whenever you're done setting up the dependency structure for your project plan, you can just collapse all these columns with one click and that gives you just a clean and dense overview of the most crucial information about the scheduled plan. And you still have full control over the workload, so adjusting the number of required workdays for an item can be done even in this dense view. And anytime you want to make a change in the underlying dependency structure, simply reopen the section and you are good to go. 
Right at the moment, all these stages perfectly summarize the duration and time span of their respective tasks and milestones. But now we want to implement a feature that goes one level above that and dynamically keeps track of and visualizes the whole project time span. For that, let's start by collapsing this extended planning section as we need to focus on the plan start and plan end column. Given the values in these two columns, we're gonna compute the project time span and duration in workdays for which we have already prepared these placeholders up there. The project time span is nothing else but the minimum and maximum of these dates in here. But we're not only gonna display these date values up there, but also gonna visualize the time span in the timeline section. Let's create a named calculation called project start that dynamically determines the minimum start date of any item in our project. The range that we pass for this starts right at the header row and in order to give this project some space to grow, we go down to row 1000. And then we set up a similar named calculation for the project end, which is calculated as the maximum of the plan end column. For the project duration in workdays, we're gonna create an additional named calculation that is based on the net workdays function and calculates the workdays between the project start and project end. That enables us to replace this manual start date up here with the dynamically calculated project start. Then replace this placeholder with the project end Let's align this one to the center and the project end to the left. And then for the project duration, we're gonna insert a concatenated expression with an opening bracket, then the dynamically calculated project duration and a closing bracket. It is important to mention here that this project duration in workdays is based on the project time span and not necessarily equal to the actual workload, especially if you have tasks and stages that run in parallel. We can now make use of these information to beautifully visualize this project time span in the timeline area. Let's make use of this row that is right on top of the current timeline and add a conditional formatting rule to these cells. We want to format all cells for which the date in the timeline is greater equal the project start and smaller equal the project end. All the cells for which this condition is true shall get this neat green background fill. That seems to work pretty good, but it still doesn't look perfect because the row still has this standard height and that is a bit over the top, so we need to make this row much tighter. Let's remove this temporary Unicode icon description and set a row height to 6 pixels. Let's add a similar conditional formatting rule to the actual timeline date rows. The formula for this rule is exactly the same. But for this one we just make the background a bit darker by changing the fill to this slightly darker grey tone. Both these conditional formattings in combination result in a pretty refined visualization of the project time span. With any change in the schedule, may it be a change in task durations or a change in a dependency structure, this visualization smoothly updates to always capture the full project time span. And in addition, this feature becomes even more valuable whenever we have a really large project because once we scroll down and the upper stages are not visible anymore, we still see the overall project time span in relation to the currently visible items. And that is pretty amazing. However, now that this project time span is dynamically computed, there are still two weak points that we have to take care of. The first weak point becomes apparent when we take a closer look at this initial timeline date cell, because that one is referencing this dynamic project start date, and that makes us run into a lot of errors in case no dates are provided in a plan start column, because now the project start date value is just zero. 
To make sure this doesn't happen, let's make the timeline start date more robust than a simple reference to the project start date and create a perfectly tailored name calculation called Timeline Plan Start. We set the scope to this worksheet and what we want to do in this calculation is we first check if project start equals zero because then we want to use today as the fallback value for the timeline start and in order to make sure that it always shows the beginning of the week of today, we simply subtract the weekday number of today with an encoding that returns 0 for Monday up until 6 for Sunday. That way, in case today is a Wednesday for example, this expression subtracts 2 and returns the Monday of the week. And only in case project start is not 0, then we return this project start value minus its weekday number with the same encoding. Then let's replace this original formula in this first timeline date cell with a defined named calculation. At the moment this project start date is the 10th of May, which is a Monday, so this is the first date displayed in the timeline. When we change this project start date to the 7th of May, which is a Friday, you can see that the timeline start calculation makes sure that the timeline starts on the Monday of that week. And last but not least, in case no dates are provided at all for the project items, the timeline uses the week of today as the fallback value to start from. So that doesn't result in an error anymore and we have successfully eliminated that weak point. The second weak point becomes apparent whenever we use the auto stage formulas to dynamically calculate the stage time span, but the dates for the items of that stage are not available yet. That will temporarily make this int start value and thus the plan start and plan end values of that stage zero, which by itself would not be a problem if it wasn't taken into account when calculating the project start date, which is now incorrectly zero as well. And that causes the timeline to use the fallback value as the starting date for actually no good reason. But no worries, this issue can be solved with a tiny adjustment in the plan start formula. This initial if statement makes sure that the value in the int start cell is only taken into account in case the cell is non-empty. Now we need to change that into making sure that this value is not only non-empty, but that it is also greater than zero. This tiny adjustment fully eliminates this second weak point. The only visible impact that we will have is that the auto stage workday function now temporarily shows an error but this is actually a good way of telling us that we need to define a schedule for at least one of the items in that stage before any stage calculation can be done here. Let's update the plan start formula for all the rows. We can perfectly see how the project start date and the timeline show the correct values now. So we can eventually redefine the dependencies for the items in the rollout prep stage. Amazing! At this state of the template we have successfully implemented the whole planning logic. This allows us to now focus on the visualization aspect of the template and set up an incredibly powerful auto coloring engine that will let us switch between four different and fully automated color modes. Let's start by hiding this planning section and setting up the drop down menu for the color mode selection. We merge these six cells Set the text alignment to the middle, set the font style to size 10 and bold, and add some gray borders. The label of this drop down selection will have the text color by, and right below is where we want to put the actual drop down menu. So let's also merge these six cells, align it to the middle, set the size to 9 this time and the background fill to this light color. To add a drop down selection, we jump straight to the data tab and open the data validation window. Allow a list of values and statically define the list of possible color modes as default, project structure, team roles, and issues. Now any of these color modes can be selected with one click and in order to make the selected value easily usable in other formulas, we can define a static cell reference up here and call this color by. 
The gray coloring that we currently have in place for the indicator colors and the Gantt chart area is what our default color mode looks like. It's clean and simple and the rules to define this coloring are simply based on the type of item. However, now that we want to implement way more complex and fully automated color modes, we need to approach this differently and introduce a system that lets us represent different coloring logics but at the same time keeps the formulas and the conditional formatting rules pretty short, easy to understand and easy to scale. That's why we're gonna build a system of numeric color codes with a color code generating formula that will cover the whole logic. And the numeric color codes returned by this formula for each row will then be used to create conditional formatting rules for both the color indicator section and the chart area. We make these color codes referenceable by setting up a dynamic name reference for these cells. For now, this color code name simply references the cell content, but later we will just insert the final formula directly into the formula field down here to make this a named calculation. As we want all the coloring, including the default colors, be based on color codes, let's take a quick look at how these default indicator colorings are currently created. Well, first let's move this one up and set the stop if true checkmark for an increased efficiency. You see, for this default coloring we have two rules in place that simply check what the type of item is. At the same time we have three different rules for the chart area as unlike for the indicator coloring, the task and milestone items require a different visualization. For our new color code system, we will move these type checks over to the color code formula and let the result be represented by some numeric codes. As we have three different rules here for the default coloring, we obviously gonna need three different default color code numbers here. For generating the default color codes, we start by making sure that the type value in row is non-empty. And then we use the switch statement to return different numbers based on which item type is selected. We keep it simple and return a 1 in case it's a stage. For tasks, we're gonna return a 2. And for milestones, it will be a 3. Otherwise, in case type is empty, we simply return a minus 1. Let's add this formula to all the rows and that gives us a numeric encoding based on which item type is selected. Let's open the conditional formatting manager for the indicator color section and change the two coloring rules. For this one we replace this logical test with color code equals 1 and for this one these two conditions will be replaced with color code equals 2 or 3. The indicator coloring still works as before since the logic behind it hasn't changed at all. So let's do the same for the chart area. We select the chart range, open the conditional formatting manager and replace this original logical test with a color code check. For stages it's 1 again for tasks 2 and for the milestones simply 3. And again it keeps working fine based on these color codes. Since the final version of this color code generating formula will be huge and we also gonna reuse this expression for the default color codes, let's copy and transform it into a named calculation called color code default. Now in the general color code formula, we can reference this expression simply by its name. That makes even more sense since for this whole formula, we now want to consider the selected color mode and build up the respective formula pattern to act based on the color mode selected. In order to find out what the currently selected color mode is, we make use of the switch function, enter this color by reference as the expression to look at, and in case the selected mode is project structure, we want to execute all the respective calculations for which we enter a placeholder value for now. In this switch statement, we can now just use the color code default calculation as the default return value. Then if team roles is selected as the color mode, we want to do a different color code calculation. 
and eventually, in case issues is selected, another calculation will be done. Let's update all the other cells with this adjusted formula. Now, when we select a different color mode, all the color code cells display the respective placeholder value for now. Let's build a color code generating expression for the project structure mode first. For this mode, we're gonna make use of eight main colors from our color palette. And we want each stage with all its items to have a new individual main color. Similar to the default color mode, we're also gonna need different color codes within a stage in order to represent the different types of items with different shades of the same color. As we need to differentiate between stages, let's start by introducing an automated stage ID system in this color. This will automatically assign the same ID to all the items of one stage. So a 1 to all the items of the first stage, a 2 for the second stage and so on. To make the stage ID easy to reference, let's add a dynamic name reference called stage ID. And then start building the formula. At first we need to make sure that type is non-empty because a non-defined item cannot belong to any stage. In case a type value is available, we do the same check we already did for the main ID in order to figure out if the item is the first one in the whole list. So in case the row of this cell is two rows below the header cell, we know this has to be the first stage and return a one. For all subsequent items, we then want to continue with the same stage ID until we reach another stage item for which we then increment the stage ID number by one. That means if type equals S, we compute the maximum ID number in the previous column range and then just add one since it's a new stage. If type is not equal S, the item is either a task or a milestone. So in that case, we just return the maximum ID number from the previous column range. Let's add this formula to all the rows and you can see how it perfectly creates consecutive stage IDs, while all the empty rows get a minus one. Let's center these values and decrease their font size. Then we're gonna test the functionality by making the second stage a task instead. You see, the stage ID perfectly adapts to the new situation by including all consecutive items into the first stage while making sure that the originally third stage has now assigned the stage ID too. And of course this also works the other way around when we make this task in the second stage a stage, this now becomes stage number three while the subsequent stage has now the stage ID four. Now that we have the stage ID defined, let's jump right into the color code formula to replace this placeholder right here with some color code generating expressions. The first thing that we're gonna make sure is in case the stage ID is minus one, the color code should also be minus one, which means no color will be displayed at all. However, in case we have an actual stage ID available, we're gonna build a three digit color code that we're gonna concatenate as a text first and then transform into a number later. For this project structure mode, the first digit for the main color is determined by the stage ID. So we use the stage ID and concatenate it with a text string that will be returned from a switch expression. Based on the selected item type, we either gonna add an 01 for a stage item, for a task item it will be 02, and for a milestone item 03. After that, this concatenated text string will then be transformed into a number by wrapping it in the number value function. And eventually we add a closing bracket for this if statement. After adding this formula to all the rows, we now have a clean numeric encoding for the project structure that beautifully represents both the stage and the item type within each stage. But there's one limitation that we haven't considered yet because we have a limited amount of main colors in our color palette. More precisely, we only want to use these eight main colors and their different shades, but at the same time we also want to be able to create an unlimited amount of stages that are all beautifully colored to be differentiable from the stages immediately around them. 
So the logical solution for this project structure mode is to reuse the color palette over and over again. So that after using all these 8 main colors for the first 8 stages, stage number 9 will just get the same colors as the first stage, then stage number 10 the same as the second stage, and so on. For the color code that means instead of using the stage ID directly, we're gonna use the so-called modulo operation, which returns the remainder from dividing the stage ID by a divisor. This divisor in our case has to be 8, so this function will basically partitionate the stage ID into a part that is divisible by 8 and a remainder that is not divisible by 8, which will then be returned. So in case the stage ID is 1, it will return 1. And if it's 9, it will take out 8 because that's divisible by 8 and then return the remainder, which is also 1. The only special case that doesn't work in our favor is whenever the stage ID is fully divisible by 8, because then it returns the remainder of 0. And in that specific case, we actually want to have an 8 as the first digit of the color code, so let's expand this by an if statement that takes care of the special case. Perfect. Let's update all the rows and now let's artificially increase the stage ID here to show you the effect of this little adjustment. You see, the color codes for all these stages are correctly generated and as soon as stage 8 is passed, it starts all over again with the initial one in the color code for stage 9 and continues like this infinitely for all the subsequent stages. Great! Let's open the conditional formatting manager for the indicator color section and create two additional rules for the first group of color codes that have a 1 as their first digit. For that we can simply duplicate these two rules that we already have in place for the default coloring and simply adjust the color codes that these rules are looking for. For the stage items of the first stage, the code is 101 the main color for this first stage in general will be this blue and since it's a stage item, let's choose this stronger main shade of the blue. In a similar manner, we adjust the formula for the task and milestone items by changing this to 102 and 103. And this time selecting this lighter shade of this blue color. Once applied, you can already see how we now have some indicator colors displayed. Let's not forget to set a check mark and yeah, there we have these beautiful color indicators for the first stage. Of course we need to set up the respective rules in the chart area as well. So let's open the conditional formatting manager for these cells and just duplicate these three different rules that we have here. As we have this powerful stopper rule in place that checks if an item is in plan within a given cell, we only need to move these new coloring rules right below that stopper rule and then we can simply focus on the right choice of color and color codes. The procedure now is pretty similar. We adjust this color code to 101 and change the fill to this strong blue. Then we adjust this rule to look for color code 102 and change the fill to this light blue. And eventually we have this separate rule for the milestone coloring, set the color code to 103 and this time we change the font color to this strong blue. And that's how easy it is to set up these corresponding coloring rules for one color code family. Switching back to the default color mode now and then back again perfectly demonstrates that all the items are still in place. The only reason why the other stages are not visible yet is that we haven't set up the conditional formatting rules corresponding to their color codes. For now, let's outsource this expression into an own named calculation that we call color code project structure. and then replace this expression in the main formula using that defined name. Before we set up the conditional formatting rules for the remaining color code families here, we first gonna implement the formula for the team roles color code generation. That's because we want to make the team roles and project structure color mode 
used the same conditional formatting rules and thus also partly the same color codes in order to make the whole implementation more lightweight and less redundant. For the team roles color codes that means we will make use of the same color palette of 8 main colors but in this context the 8 main colors will represent these 8 team roles that can be defined in the settings worksheet. As we have the team role short codes available in this column we can easily implement a corresponding role ID encoding by looking up the role shortcode in the settings worksheet. For that, let's start by defining a dynamic name reference for this role column and also a dynamic name reference for the role ID column. And then we use the match formula to look up the role in this array. Make sure to make this an absolute range reference with dollar signs and eventually enter a zero to look for exact matches. The statement will simply return the team role's position in the settings team role's list and we can directly use this position as the role ID. As you see, if this roll cell is empty, this will result in an NA error. So let's add an if NA statement to catch that error and return a minus 1 instead. Then we can add this formula to the whole column and that gives us a simple but effective encoding of the assigned roll. Let's just decrease the font size to 8 and align it to the center. And a quick visual check tells us, yes, it seems like each role is adequately represented by its position in the settings worksheet role type section. I still want to make one additional modification to this formula and you might agree or not agree with me on this one. In my opinion, it makes sense to limit the team member assignment to tasks and milestones only because these are always connected to real actions, while stages tend to be more abstract concepts mainly used to better structure the whole project and to group items together. So my preferred approach, at least for this color-related visualization here, is to only return a role ID for tasks and milestones. While for stages, we're simply gonna return a minus one. With this modification, you can still assign a team member to a stage if you like, but it won't be considered by the auto coloring engine. Okay, let's use this role ID to replace this placeholder with some meaningful computations. The first thing we do here is checking if the role ID equals minus one. You have to know this minus one can have multiple reasons. Either there is no item defined in the respective row at all, or there is an item that has no team member assigned, or it is a stage item, which means it will be minus one by default. For all these cases, we want to apply the default coloring as fallback option, because this ensures that even if there will be no team role related coloring, the item is still visualized. And in case we have an actual role ID available, then we build a three digit color code, just like we did for the project structure mode. The number value function again helps us to transform a concatenated text string into a numeric value and within this function we concatenate the role ID as the initial digit and then use the switch statement to determine the last two digits based on the item type. As there is no need to visualize the hierarchical differences between a stage and its items, we don't need to use different shades of a color this time. And thus we simply use the strong shade version of each main color for both the tasks and the milestones. That means in case the type is a task, we generate a color code ending on 01. These are the ending digits that we used for the stage items in the project structure mode, which means we can make use of the exact same conditional formatting rules for the indicator color and Gantt bar visualization. And for the milestones, we have to introduce a new color code ending 04, as so far we have no color code ending that corresponds to both a strong color shade for the indicator color and a strong font color for the Gantt chart area. Let's close the statement, update all the color code cells in this column and take a quick look at what we got now. 
The initial thing we can notice is that all items that have no team member and role assigned are visualized with the default gray coloring, so that is working correctly. Then when looking at the visible three digit color codes, 101, which corresponds to the tasks assigned to the project management role, is the only one for which we actually have defined conditional formatting rules so far. It is also obvious that with the team roles color mode, all these three digit color codes will only end on either 01 or 04. So let's include this 04 ending into the conditional formatting rules that we already have in place. As we want to have a strong color shade here, we're gonna make this rule an OR statement that also considers 104. And for the Gantt chart area, we just include this color code into the rule that we have already set up for the milestones in particular. So let's make this an OR statement that also includes color code 104. With this setup, now all project management items are automatically visualized in this corresponding strong blue. And to show you that this doesn't have any negative impact on the functionality of the project structure mode, we quickly switch over here and it still works perfectly fine. The only thing left for both modes is now the setup of the conditional formatting rules for all the remaining three digit color codes that have two to eight as their starting digit. Before we do that, we're gonna clean up this main color code formula by putting the team roles calculation into a separate named calculation. We call it color code team roles. Just paste it, click OK, and replace this expression with the respective name. After updating the formula for all the rows, we are now ready to set up the conditional formatting rules for all the remaining three digit color codes that we have in here. Fortunately, that process will be pretty straightforward. For the indicator column, we're gonna duplicate these two specific rules seven times and then stack them on top of each other. Then we leave the first set of these two rules as they are and jump straight to the second set for which we now gonna adjust the color codes and color formatting. This will be for the color codes 201 and 204 and the color of choice here is this red tone. And in the same manner for the color codes 202 and 203 we want to have this light shade version of that red color to be displayed. We continue this process until we have covered all the color codes up to the code starting with an 8. For each new pair of rules, we are gonna select a new main color from which we pick the strong and light shade versions. I gonna speed up the process here a little bit to save you some time.
Once this process is finished, you can see how the indicator column beautifully displays all the required colors, no matter what the stage number is. And when we switch to the Team Roles color mode, all assigned roles now have the corresponding indicator color displayed. Of course, we also have to go through this process for the chart area. So let's select this range, open the Conditional Formatting Rule Manager, and start replicating this set of rules until we have eight of these sets stacked on top of each other. I know this takes a little while, but it will be well worth the effort. Once we have 8 sets, let's jump straight to the second set, start with the first rule, change the initial digit to 2 and then select the corresponding color. It will always be the strong shade version of the respective color for the 01 ending, then for the 02 ending it will be the light shade version. and the strong shade font color version for the 03 and 04 ending of the color code. Once we apply these updated rules, we can already see in the background that the second stage now became fully visible again in this beautiful colorized design. And that should give us enough motivation to do this six more times for the remaining color codes. The only important thing you have to make sure here is that the color families used for these rules are consistent between the indicator column and the chart area. Great! At this point we have completed the most difficult part of this auto coloring engine. It has been some effort, but the result we can now look at is well worth it. In project structure mode, the whole project structure is now beautifully visualized with different color families for each stage. Any update to the project structure is immediately reflected in both the indicator and the chart section, and with this lightweight design that reuses the color palette over and over again, every stage is colored differently than the stages that are immediately around it. And you can add as many stages as you want. That is really amazing. Then for the Team Rolls color mode, we were able to reuse the same exact conditional formatting rules but with a completely different logic that represents each assigned role with its own individual color. Let's see what happens when we change the role of Y-Lin from Finance to Marketing. 
this update is immediately reflected with a new color for the marketing role. As we have the default coloring in place as a fallback option for all the items that have no team member assigned, each item is visible at any time and once we decide to assign a team member for example here, it will simply update the color with a smooth transition. Amazing! That means by now we are able to choose between the simple and less colorful default color mode, the project structure color mode or the team roles color mode with one single click. Eventually let's implement the last color mode that will allow you to highlight items for which an issue has arisen. Since the corresponding formula will be based on this issue column, let's make the cells dynamically referenceable as issue. Then copy that Unicode issue symbol and start replacing this placeholder with a formula. We're gonna use an if statement to instantly check if issue equals the symbol. And if that's the case, we want to generate one of two potential color codes. As for the other two advanced color modes, we have only used one to eight as the initial digit. We now simply create two color codes that are 901 and 902. 901 will be used whenever the type is stage or task. And as we need a separate rule for the font formatting of milestone symbols, we create a separate code 902 for these. It is simple as that. And of course we still want to display all the other items without issues, so again we just use the color code default calculation as the fallback option. We close the statement, update all the rows and the only thing left to do is adding the corresponding conditional formatting rules. For the indicator column we only need one simple rule that we can use for both color codes. So in case the color code equals 901 or 902 we want to have a warning red fill here. And then only for the chart area we need to make the distinction between the item types So we duplicate these two rules here. The first one will be for the color code 901 and simply fill the cell with this warning red, while the second rule is meant to be for the milestone symbols, so color code 902 and a warning red font style. Perfect! Now whenever we switch between the default and the issues color mode, the red color smoothly covers the underlying default colors and that is simply beautiful. Finally we only need to take care of the main color code formula. At first we transform this expression into a named calculation called color code issues. Replace this part accordingly. Quickly test if all the color modes still work as required. That looks fine. And now instead of having this color code formula written in each individual cell of this column and dynamically reference each of these cells with the color code name, we can simply take this formula and put it directly in here to make this a straight named calculation. For that however I recommend to remove all the line breaks and spacing otherwise it will be difficult to read in the name manager. And then we simply copy and paste it right here.
So the cell content in column A is no longer needed and we can remove it. Resize this column to get back the original worksheet design. Minimize this formula bar. And finally, go through all the color modes one more time. Simply beautiful. Let's move on to the next amazing feature that will help you to take a snapshot of your actual plan, save it as the base plan and then compare it to the changes that you make to your actual plan over time. The crucial idea of this feature is that once you have built up your schedule with all the dependencies, you can document the date of the recent changes you made, then jump over to the base plan section by unhiding these two columns and just copy over the actual plan as plain values. Let's decrease the font size for this and change the font color to this dark gray. And once you have taken that snapshot, you should also document the date up there so that you always know when the snapshot was taken. Now, when time goes by and you decide to adjust your actual plan, like for example postponing the project start by one week and this decision has been made on the 7th of May. You now have both the original base plan and the actual plan side by side and you also know exactly how much time has passed between these two versions of the plan through the date documentation at the top. Our goal now is to implement an option that allows us to visually display and compare both the base plan and the actual plan in the chart area. Let's start by adding another drop-down menu that we call display and that will have two list items to select from. The first option is simply called plan and refers to only showing the actual plan, while the second item will be called plan versus base which means we want to have both plans visualized in the chart area at the same time. Let's select plan for now because that is the default option that is already in place here. Then we create a static name for these cells and call it simply display. And of course we are also gonna add some dynamic name references for both the date columns of the base plan. So for the base start, as always, we're going to remove the dollar sign here. And of course, the base end. Based on this base start and base end, we now want to create a named calculation that does exactly the same for the base plan, like the item and plan calculation already does for the actual plan. To remind you, the item and plan calculation simply checks for every cell in the chart area if the date value in the timeline in the respective column is in between the plan start and plan end date and then returns either true or false. And for the base plan we can set up a similar named calculation. So let's copy this, create a new name, call it item in base, set the scope to this worksheet paste the formula and now we simply overwrite this with base start and base end. Whenever we select the plan with a space option up here, we now want to use this item in base calculation to additionally display the original base plan in here. For the milestone symbols that we currently generate with a formula from within the cells, this means here we now have to display an additional milestone symbol basically one week earlier. Let's adjust this formula to do exactly that. Instead of simply checking if type equals M and item in plan, we now want to do this type check initially. And after that we add a second if statement to figure out if the item is in plan in the current cell. If that is the case, we are gonna return this milestone symbol independently from the current display mode because we want the actual plan to always be displayed in both modes. The special aspect to consider now is, in case we are in plan versus base mode, we only want to display an additional symbol for the base plan if it is not on the same day as the one from the actual plan. So it makes sense to only consider the selected display mode if item in plan returns false. In that case, we only want to print a milestone symbol for the base plan 
if the plan vs spade mode is selected and the item in base calculation returns true. Otherwise, we simply return an empty text string, just like we do in case the type does not equal M. Perfect! Let's add this formula to all the cells in the chart area. And you see, we now have the base plan milestones displayed in addition to the actual plan milestones. And we can control whether to hide or display them via this drop down selection up there. Right at the moment, these milestone symbols of the base plan have the default dark blue font color. But we're gonna change that into a font color that is less standing out. Let's open the conditional formatting manager and create a new rule that will directly target these symbols only. To only be applied to the base plan milestone symbols, the formula for this rule has to test multiple conditions, which are display equals plan versus base, item in base has to be true, and of course, in case the base and actual plan milestone are on the same date, we don't want this rule to be applied and just apply the actual plan coloring. That means we have to put the item in plan into a not statement to reverse it. And eventually, of course, type has to be M. For the formatting, we choose this super light gray, which is even lighter than the default coloring gray of the actual plan. So no matter which color mode you have selected, these two should always be distinguishable. Once we confirm that, that looks pretty amazing. From a visual standpoint, it is instantly clear which of both is the active actual plan and which one is the snapshot base plan. For visualizing the stages and tasks of the base plan, we will only need to create one conditional formatting rule. Let's select the range again, open the conditional formatting manager, Here we can see, we should move this milestone rule a bit down, right on top of the actual plan stopper rule. Then we can just duplicate it and adjust this formula for the stages and tasks of the base plan. For these, we also need to make sure that the item in base calculation returns true, but unlike for the milestones, we want the stages and tasks of the base plan overlay the actual plan stages and task bars if necessary. You will see how that can be done in the formatting options in a second. For the formula though, this means we don't have to make sure that item in plan is false, so we can just throw that part out. And eventually we're gonna change this last condition into an OR statement that checks if type is either stage or task. For the formatting, we change the font color back to automatic, go to the fill tab, and the reason why we can have both the base plan and the actual plan visualized in the same cell is that we're gonna use pattern fills for the base plan. That means if a cell in the chart area is part of both the base plan and the actual plan, the pattern fill of the base plan will simply overlay the full cell fill of the actual plan. As the color for this pattern fill, I recommend to use this dark gray because that allows us to use this not so heavy point pattern that says 25% gray and it will be still perfectly visible. Let's click OK and there we have the beautiful but still subtle visualization of the base plan compared against the actual plan. Even for the darker colors, you can easily identify the part where both the base plan and the actual plan overlay as it is either darker or brighter than the rest of the item Depending on the specific color palette that you use, I recommend to play around with the pattern style a bit in order to make these overlay parts easy to differentiate from the rest. With the drop down selection up here, we now have full control over the visibility of this base plan, which allows us to keep the complexity in the chart area low and only display the base plan when we really need it. For a seamless user experience, I also want to make sure that the timeline will automatically adjust its initial date to perfectly show the full extent of both the actual and the base plan. Right now, this initial timeline start date is only based on the actual plan. For that reason, the base plan, which starts on the 7th of May, is not fully visible here. In order to change that, 
Let's start by adding a named calculation that computes the project start date according to the base plan. Which is simply the minimum value within the base start column. Using the start date of the base plan, we can then set up another calculation similar to the timeline plan start calculation. We're gonna call this timeline base start. And all this does is taking the raw project base start and calculating the start of the respective week by subtracting its weekday number, which will be encoded as a 0 for Monday and a 6 for Sunday. So this will return the Monday of the week of the base plan start. Now that we have both the timeline plan start and the timeline base start defined, we can now make the initial timeline date dependent on the display mode. In case display equals plan versus base, then we have to make sure that the timeline base start is greater than zero. If that is true, we're gonna return the earlier of both the timeline base start and the timeline plan start. That makes sure that no matter if the base plan is ahead or behind the actual plan, the timeline will always optimally adjust. In case we haven't taken a snapshot yet, which means the timeline base start is not greater than zero, the timeline plan start will be directly used even if the plan was a space mode is active. And in case the selected display mode is not plan versus space, then the timeline plan start will be used just like before. Once we hit enter, you can instantly see how the timeline perfectly adjusts to show the full base plan. The base plan starts on the 7th of May and the timeline starts right at the beginning of that particular week. And once we change the display mode back to plan, the timeline also adjusts accordingly and that way you don't have to actively manipulate the timeline view in order to have everything visible. In case the base plan section is empty, it directly uses the timeline plan start. And in case the actual plan is not behind but ahead, so starting earlier than the base plan, this case is also perfectly covered. This base plan visualization also works fully independent from the color modes. So the only thing left here is to convert this timeline start formula into an own named calculation called timeline start. Let's replace this whole formula with a clean and simple timeline start calculation reference. And that is it for this feature. As the next step, let's add an intuitive and partly automated way of tracking the progress and visualizing it in a good looking and easy to interpret way. For this, we have this one column left at the end of the input section. And we begin with changing the numbers format to percentage. That way we can enter the percentage of completion for each item and it automatically gets the percentage symbol assigned even during typing. Every percentage of completion that we have entered should then be reflected in the Gantt chart accordingly given that we have activated the progress visualization. To activate and deactivate the progress visualization, let's add another drop-down menu with the label Show Progress. and yes or no as the selectable options. To easily access the selected value in other formulas, let's call this cell show progress. And of course, we also need this percentage completed value accessible as well. So we create a dynamic name reference called percentage complete. Taking this percentage complete value, we then want to visualize the corresponding number of completed workdays in the chart area. So for the stage, it would be 60% of 10 workdays, which means we need to highlight the initial six workdays as completed. To figure out for each cell in the chart area if it is part of this completed time span or not, we need to set up a named calculation that is similar to the item and plan calculation. 
So let's copy that formula, create a new name that is called item incomplete, set the scope as usual, and paste the formula. As we want the progress bar to start from the beginning of an item, we can leave the first condition that makes sure that the date in that column is greater equal to plan start. What we have to modify is the second condition, because instead of just taking the plan end as the upper limit, we want to dynamically compute the end of the completed time span, starting from the plan start and then adding the equivalent number of completed workdays. The function that is perfect for this is the workday function, because it allows us to enter the plan start and then add the number of completed workdays. To compute the number of completed workdays, we simply multiply the percentage complete and the number of required workdays. And since the plan start date is already one of the days in the time span, we have to subtract one from this product. When looking at this first stage item, this named calculation we have just set up should now return true for all these six highlighted cells. So we can use it to set up conditional formatting rules for the progress visualization. The first rule will be targeting the stage and task items. And we want to highlight a cell as completed workday whenever we have selected yes in the show progress dropdown selection. And the column date is within the time span of completed workdays. So item incomplete has to be true. And since this rule is for stage and task items, the type has to either equal S or T. If all these conditions are met, we want the cell to be filled with this dark blue color. In the conditional formatting manager, it is now crucial that this rule is placed somewhere on top of the other actual plan coloring rules because that makes sure that this dark blue progress fill will always cover and not be covered by all the subsequent rules. For an increased efficiency, don't forget to set a check mark at this stop if true option and then we click OK to take a look at the beautiful result. As you can see, the completed workdays are now correctly displayed for the stage and task items in accordance with the given percentage values. It is important to mention that the cell can only be either fully filled or not filled. That means for a workday to be displayed as completed, the full workday equivalent has to be completed by then. For this task, for example, the second day will only be displayed as completed when we have surpassed the 67% threshold. In a similar manner, the percentage complete value has to be at least 50% for this task before any progress is visible. Now that we have taken care of the stage and task items, let's focus on the progress visualization for the milestones, which will be really special. First, we're gonna create a conditional formatting rule for the coloring. And for that, we can simply duplicate the progress rule that we have just set up, move it down, and then adjust this last condition to type equals M. For the formatting, we don't want to have a cell fill, but we want to set the font color to the same dark blue. That's it. So now as soon as that percentage value is set to 100%, it's now colored as completed, which is great. But to make this even greater, let's make the milestone symbol also transform into this finish flag icon to emphasize that we have successfully crossed the finish line. So let's copy it and modify the symbol generating formula. As we want to have the progress only visualized for the actual plan and not the base plan, this is the only place we're gonna do any modifications. And instead of directly printing this milestone symbol, we're now gonna ask if show progress is set to yes and if maybe this milestone is already completed. So if item incomplete. If that is the case, we print that beautiful flag symbol. Otherwise, just a standard milestone symbol. Let's close that if statement and add this updated formula to the whole Gantt chart range. And there is the beautiful finish flag for this completed milestone. Amazing! When we delete that 100%, the symbol perfectly transforms back to the regular milestone symbol and putting it back in there will just make it retransform. 
Of course, this milestone transformation works for every single milestone, and the whole progress visualization can be turned on and off up there, so it is safe to say that the fundamental progress tracking feature is completed by now. And that gives us the great opportunity to take a closer look at how we can partly automate the progress tracking itself. What makes most sense to automate here is the progress tracking of the stages. Because for most use cases it makes sense to have the progress of the stage item linearly reflect the progress over all items, or at least the tasks covered in that stage. For that purpose, I have prepared another auto stage placeholder formula up there. This formula basically just computes the sum product of the workdays and the progress of all items belonging to this stage, and then divides that by the sum of total workdays over all items at this stage. Once applied, the stage progress now automatically updates every time we change the progress value for these tasks. Once all the items in the stage are completed, the stage is completed as well, and that just saves you a lot of manual work. To highlight the fact that the stage progress is linked to other cells, we're gonna use the same blue font color formatting that we already have set up for multiple other columns, like the Workdays column for example. Here we have that respective conditional formatting rule, Let's add this column to the relevant range by typing in a comma and selecting the column values. Perfect! And now we instantly see, okay, this stage progress is automatically calculated and linking to other cells. Let's add this auto stage progress formula to the other stages as well. And keep in mind, if you have a different number of items in a stage, you have to adjust the referenced ranges in that formula to make it work correctly. In our example case here, where all the stages have the same number of items, we were able to automate the progress tracking of all these stages within a few seconds. Regarding the milestone items here, there is one thing that you should be aware of. With this auto stage progress formula, you're gonna create references to the workday and progress cells directly and not to their dynamic name references which also means an empty workday cell, like we have here for the milestone item, will be counted as zero and not as one, and thus not impact the calculated stage progress. At least not until we put an actual one in there. In my personal opinion, that actually is a good thing, because milestones are something that should not be measured in workdays, and they are often tied to the completion of tasks anyway, so I will leave the workday cells empty, in case you want your milestones to contribute linearly to the stage progress, all you need to do is just enter a 1 in that workday cell. Since I just mentioned that the completion of milestones might be tied to the completion of tasks, let me quickly show you how that can be done correctly. Let's say that we want this milestone to be set to 100%, only in case that this task here is fully completed. For that we can type in the formula 1 times that progress value equals 1. This whole expression will only return 1, or in other words 100%, in case the task completion is exactly 100%. In all other cases, this will always return 0. Once we hit enter, we see that the milestone progress is now highlighted in blue, telling us that this links to another cell, and with the task being at 100% completion, the milestone is completed as well. But as soon as we only take away 1% here, the milestone completion is set to 0%. Of course, this concept can also be extended to multiple tasks. For example, to make the milestone completion dependent on the completion of all task items in the stage, we can check if the sum of these values equals the number of task items. And now whenever any of these tasks is not completed anymore, the milestone completion is immediately set back to zero. I think this concept alone is something that makes this progress tracking and visualization feature even more powerful. At this point we have achieved a huge milestone, as all the formulas and conditional formatting rules for visualizing stages, tasks and milestones in any possible form are now completed. 
The whole implementation is already pretty lightweight, efficient and reactive, yet there's still some improvement potential which you might recognize when we turn on and off the progress visualization. The progress bars and flags appear and disappear pretty fast, but there is still a tiny tiny lag of a few milliseconds, which we can decrease a lot with a powerful trick. And that trick I'm gonna reveal to you right now. One big reason why at the moment it takes a bit longer for this worksheet to update when we for example turn on the progress visualization is that the visualization of the milestone symbols is a two-step process. The first step in this process is to print the actual milestone symbols into the cell based on this in-cell formula and then in a second step we apply the conditional formatting rules to give them their respective color. It is not possible to entirely eliminate this first step as the cells still need to have some content to display these Unicode icons, yet we are able to simplify the cell content by making the icon definition part of the respective conditional formatting rules. To do that, let's copy this default milestone icon, open the conditional formatting manager and scroll straight to the bottom to start with the first milestone coloring rule. At the moment, this rule only defines the color for this milestone icon. But when we go to the number tab and select the custom category, we can apply the same trick we previously used for the auto stage start date. Instead of defining a number pattern, we just paste in the milestone icon here. At the moment, the sample section shows nothing because to make this work, we need to have some numeric value written into the cell, which we will do in a second. But for now, let's click OK and we instantly see that this milestone symbol is now the default number formatting applied by this rule. Let's quickly adjust the formatting for all the other milestone rules in the same way. This also includes the Issues Milestone rule and the one to display the base plan milestones. Only for the Progress Milestone rule, we're gonna need to use the flag icon. So let's copy this one, reopen the Conditional Formatting Rule Manager and adjust the number format for this rule accordingly. And that's it! At the moment the milestone symbols are still generated by this formula in the cells, but since the conditional formatting rules that we have built alongside this formula basically have inherited the full logic of when to display which symbol, we can now simply remove this formula from all the cells and replace it with a random numeric value, like for example zero. As I told you before, the cells have to contain some numeric value, otherwise the number format of the conditional formatting rules cannot be applied to anything. So we add zero to all the cells in the chart area, then we set the default number format for all these cells to an empty string to hide these zeros in all non-milestone positions, And what's left are the milestone symbols that are purely generated from these conditional formatting rules. For some reason, when we generate the symbols that way, they seem to require a bit more space, so let's slightly decrease the font size to make them visible. And there we go! Everything works just like before, but now the cell content is as simple as one random number, that means no additional calculation has to happen in these cells, and the impact of this reduction of required calculations can be noticed immediately when we now turn this show progress option off and on. The visual updates in the chart area happen almost immediately without the lag that we had before, so it seems this optimization had a significant impact on the worksheet performance and efficiency. Great! 
to perfectly complement the progress tracking feature, we now gonna introduce a feature that lets you either statically highlight a particular day visible in the timeline or dynamically highlight the current day to put the project progress into perspective. For this date highlighting feature, we want to have a drop down selection that has all the dates in the timeline and in addition an option for today available. So let's create a new drop down selection that has the label highlight. Then we give this drop down cell the static reference name highlight and change the background fill to a light green this time. Unlike for the other drop down selections up there, we want this list to not contain fixed static values, but to reference our timeline range in order to make it dynamically update and always display exactly those dates that are visible. As these date cells spread over multiple rows, we get this warning alert. Because you can only reference either a single row or a single column. But no worries, we can manually adjust this to only reference the cells in row 10, as this will make all the values accessible just as well. Let's click OK and take a look at the drop down selection we get. As you see, the full range of dates visible in the timeline from the 10th of May to the 12th of July is now selectable here. Let's select the 7th of June and set the number format to our preferred date style. So far the drop down list lets us select a particular static date that won't change once selected. However, we also want to have an item in that list that dynamically represents the current date. And the limitation of this data validation source definition is we cannot compose a list by combining a range reference and a manually entered value. So the only option we have is to make the additional item part of that referenced range. At the moment, we are referencing these items in row 10. So why not make use of this empty cell right here to add one additional value to the list. Let's just expand this list to include column W and then enter a placeholder text value for the dynamic date highlighting. When we now open the drop down list, today is listed as the primary item at the top of the list and that makes totally sense from a user experience perspective because most of the time we just want to dynamically highlight today. And only occasionally we might want to highlight a particular static date in the chart. Okay. To highlight the selected date in the chart area, we're gonna create a new conditional formatting rule that is able to work with both the dynamic and the static highlighting options. We use an if statement to check if highlight equals today, because we cannot use that text value directly to highlight the current date. In that case, we need to compare the date in the timeline with the today function, which returns an actual date. Alternatively, highlight has to be one of the static dates, in which case we can directly compare the date and the highlight value. While the static dates from the drop down selection will always be one of the visible workday dates from the timeline, the dynamic date of today might be on a non working day, like Sunday. And in such a case, we want to highlight the next working day. The next working day can be easily found by applying the workday function, passing today minus one regular day as the start date, and then adding one workday. In case today is a workday, then this expression will have no impact as it will just jump back and forth to the same exact date. But in case it is a non-working day like Sunday, it would jump back to Saturday and then forward to the next workday, which is probably a Monday. Let's take a look at the formatting that we want to use to highlight a date. We want all these cells that are in the same column as the selected date to have a dark blue right border with a dotted style because that will give us a continuous line that is positioned right at the end of the selected date. Then for the timeline date and weekday section up there, we're gonna add a similar conditional formatting rule that has the same formula, so it will also be applied to the same selected date, but exclusively to these upper cells. The design we choose here is a dark blue fill and a bold and green font style. 
let's adjust the brightness of this green tone for an improved contrast. And after confirming, we see that the selected date is now beautifully highlighted in the timeline section, while the respective dotted line is positioned right at the end of that highlighted day. With this setup, we can now switch between any of the visible timeline dates or use the dynamic today option to always highlight the current day. Whenever the timeline values update, for example with us activating the base plan comparison, not only does the highlighted date correctly move with the timeline, but also the drop-down selection is updated correctly to now offer us the newly visible timeline dates. I have intentionally chosen this exact design for the date highlighting feature, because it perfectly fits into the overall color and design theme, it is visually not too dominant, and the most important point is it perfectly complements the progress visualization through the matching dark blue color and the end of the date highlighting with that dotted line. This design allows us to instantly see how many workdays we are behind with each item when compared to the selected date. Let's assume today is the 8th of June. Then we instantly recognize that everything behind that blue line that doesn't have the same dark blue color is still open, but should be done by the end of the day. In case today would be one day later, we instantly see that we are a few workdays behind with that stage. Long story short, it is just an incredibly clean, effective and easy to interpret visualization feature. As the final step, I want to show you how to add some easy to use scroll buttons to dynamically move the timeline to the right and left. This will be especially helpful if you have a larger project that doesn't fully fit the screen at once. The way scrolling for this timeline works is actually pretty simple. To scroll to the right, we only need to add a number of workdays to this initial timeline start date. And as we want to control this number of added workdays using scroll buttons, we need to put that value somewhere in the worksheet. Let's just use this cell right here, put a zero in here for now, give the cell a name reference called scroll increment, and then add that value to the timeline start date via the workday function. To now intuitively control this number, let's go to the Developer tab, which you can activate in the Excel settings in case it is not visible, and then we insert the form control element called scroll bar. Put it right here and adjust its size so that only these scroll buttons are available here. By focusing on these scroll buttons only, the scrolling process is much more controllable and the element can just be placed at the top right corner while not requiring too much space. To make these buttons now control the scroll increment number, we simply have to link it to this cell. Then we set the maximum value to 50, let the incremental change at 1 for now, and remove the 3D shading for a cleaner design. That is all we need to make this timeline scroll to the right and left using our mouse only. Great! You can perfectly see how the scroll increment number increases and decreases continuously as long as we keep the respective button pressed. To increase the scroll speed, we could either modify the formula in the initial timeline date cell, or alternatively, just right click and format these buttons to increase the value for the incremental change to 5 for example, which basically makes the scrolling 5 times faster. Amazing! Eventually, I recommend to hide the content of these two cells. Quickest way to do that is just setting the font color to white. And at this point, we have finally completed the creation process of this incredible Ultimate Excel Gansha template. What a great result! To help you make the most out of this template, let me give you some additional advice on the best way to add, manage and even filter items in this template. Let's take a look at this 4 stage scan chart. The most common way of adding new items is just adding them at the bottom. And if you know that you want to add multiple items, make sure that you have one empty row available that is part of the Gantt chart, because then you can just easily select the whole row 
and use the autofill function to add as many new rows to the scan chart as you want. All the conditional formatting rules and drop down menus are automatically available for these new rows, so you can instantly start adding new items. In case you have accidentally used the last row and thus no free row is available in a scan chart, just use the autofill function to create one additional row, then delete all the values from the input columns, and after that you can use it to add as many new rows as you wish. In case you want to insert an item between other items, for example, let's assume we want to insert another task for this implementation stage, I recommend to make use of the Quick Access Toolbar up there. This is the section in your Excel application that by default includes these save, undo and redo commands, and most of you might be used to having this positioned right above the ribbon, but especially for this template, I prefer to have that quick access toolbar below that ribbon to make some helpful custom commands available with one click. I have already added these four commands used to fill down, fill up, insert rows and filter and I can easily add additional ones that might be useful for this use case like deleting sheet rows simply by selecting it on the left side here, clicking on add and potentially changing the order of these commands. This is how you can quickly customize this toolbar to include your preferred commands and in our case improve the user experience significantly. Because now we no longer have to right click here in order to insert or delete a row, but instead we can simply press this command to insert a row, then use the fill down command to autofill the new row with formulas and values from above, so that we only have to rename the task and potentially assign it to a different team member. In case we don't want to have a consecutive dependency, we can adjust this dependency ID, but in our case we rather change the milestone to be dependent on this inserted task instead, so we drag this reference down to 10, and that's it. In case we want to delete this task again, we only have to select the row and use this delete sheet row command from the quick access toolbar. And of course, now we have to relink the milestone to be dependent on another task again. In addition, the way we have set up this scan chart offers a lot of exciting dimensions to filter the items by. For a quick and lightweight filtering, I recommend to make use of the native filter function that you can easily include in your quick access toolbar. To filter the scan chart by a specific column, just select the respective column including the column header, then press the filter command which adds this filter arrow to the column header and allows you to do your filter selection. For example, we can easily create a high level view of the project by displaying stages only. That gives us a compressed view of the full schedule and the general project progress. Removing the filter is as easy as pressing the filter command one more time. Since we have defined the stage ID in an own column, we can use the filter command to only display selected stages, including their task and milestone items. That allows us to have multiple stages that are actually placed far apart from each other in a condensed view. Another great idea is to filter by the assigned team role, which allows you to break down the project not simply based on single team members, but instead based on areas of responsibility which also points out the distribution of tasks between team members of the same role. Two other really interesting columns are these date columns, because when applying a filter to one of these, you can choose from a huge selection of specific date filters. Just to show you one of them, let's filter down to all items starting after the 26th of May. works like a charm. And that is it for this tutorial. If you want to download this ultimate Excel Gantt chart template, it is available on excelfind.com. The link for that is in the description. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and I'd be curious to know what additional features you would love to see in this Gantt chart template. Let me know in the comments, any constructive feedback and of course a thumbs up is appreciated. 
And that being said, I wish you a beautiful day and see you next time. Cheers.